and welcome to the 11th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones, tablets or, or other electronic devices. We have received apologies this morning from Richard Baker, MSP. Our first item of business today is to decide whether to take items 4, 5, 6 and 7 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to take evidence on the UK economic and fiscal outlook. I therefore would like to welcome to the meeting uh, Robert Choate, uh, Chairman of the Office for Budget Responsibility. And before we move to questions, I invite Robert to make an opening statement. Good morning, Robert. Uh, good morning, convener. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be back. Um, I should just preface what I say today by uh, warning you that we are now in what is formally the PERDA period as a result of the UK general election, which means I'm supposed to be even more opaque and incomprehensible in my answers than I normally would be. So uh, uh, if you think you understand what I've said, then I, it's not what I meant to say. <laughs> um, shall I start off by just saying a little bit about the, the sort of the broad highlights of the, uh, of the uh, latest um, uh, economic and fiscal forecast that we published alongside the UK uh, budget uh, and in doing so comparing it largely with what we published at the end of last year uh, at the time of the autumn statement. Um, on the economy, if you think about what had changed between uh, December and March, there were a number of factors uh, that were both positive and negative for uh, the economy. Uh, most uh, dramatically, a further sharp fall uh, in the oil price. Uh, the uh, spot price had fallen by about 27% between the two forecasts and the medium term level implied by the first couple of years of the uh, futures curve by about 17% uh, between those two uh, forecasts. We also saw a further substantial rise in net inward migration uh, into the UK, uh, about 298,000 uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, year uh, and that is significantly higher than we had been anticipating in terms of the, the levels over the next few years. And what we've done now is to plug into our forecast an assumption that net inward migration declines to about 165,000 a year rather than 105,000 a year. We basically have to choose between a variety of options in terms of population projections presented by the Office for National Statistics. We've seen uh, a downward movement in market interest rate expectations, which at one level you can look at as a positive stimulus. On the other hand, it may be reflecting the fact that people are more gloomy about growth prospects, so you could read that either way. We had a series of downward revisions to past GDP growth estimates through 2013 and 2014, which were very slightly reversed in the data that was published yesterday. We had another disappointing quarter for productivity, growth output per uh, worker, output per hour, uh, continuing the uh, historic uh, weakness of productivity by historic standards. And we also had a weaker global outlook, judging from the forecasts published by the IMF and the OECD and the like. All of those taken together, we judged would have a relatively modest net effect on our GDP forecast and on, uh, on the budget deficit. We've edged up our growth forecast slightly uh, in the near term, reflecting the fact that the lower oil price uh, via primarily lower fuel prices uh, reduces inflation, pushes up temporarily uh, real, consume, uh, real uh, incomes, and therefore we've assumed a boost from consumer spending. If you go slightly further into the future, you have growth nudged down in 2017 because of the assumption that oil production is going to be weaker throughout the forecast as a result of the lower oil price. And then right at the end of the forecast, a slight upward nudge because of the uh, uh, high, assumed higher levels of net inward migration. But essentially speaking, looking over the forecast as a whole, you've got growth of about 2.5% a year stretching out over the, uh, over the five years. Uh, the other main difference being uh, lower inflation, obviously, in the near term than we were anticipating then with inflation near zero and presumably negative in some uh, months on the, uh, on the CPI measure. Turning from that to the public finance, the position of the public finances, we've essentially revised down both receipts and spending uh, somewhat over the, uh, over the course of the, uh, of the, of the forecast. On the spending side, in particular, the combination of lower interest rate, uh, market interest rates, 
uh, and lower inflation means that servicing index linked gilts is less expensive and also welfare bills are less expensive because you presume that uh, benefit values are not going to be uprated as quickly as the otherwise uh, would do. Uh, the impact of that on the public finances is somewhat offset by the fact that the government sets out a medium-term profile for overall public spending, which it's changed, but on the basis of that overall approach, if you save some money on debt interest, it doesn't necessarily feed through to a lower forecast for government borrowing. It reduces the squeeze, somewhat implied squeeze, on public services. Uh, on receipts, there's a number of uh, reasons why we've uh, pulled those down. Uh, one reason, the uh, oil receipts, uh, lower interest rates, reducing the income the government gets from uh, its assets, etc., and some other changes on, on various tax uh, measures. Uh, if you think about the impact that the budget policy measures had, starting point is to look at what you might think of as the, the menu with prices that appears in the, uh, in the Treasury's Red Book, the list of individual tax and spending measures and the costs uh, attached to those. This is another fiscal event pretty much in common with every one that we've seen subsequent to the quote-unquote emergency budget in 2010 in that the giveaways broadly match the takeaways over the five years and indeed in most years. So that's not making a great deal of difference to the outlook uh, for borrowing. The government is, to summarise, bringing in some more money from the banks and by reducing the value of pension relief for relatively uh, high earners and is spending the money on things like a higher income tax allowance, subsidy for first-time uh, buyers and uh, measures to help the uh, oil sector. What's made more difference to uh, the outlook in terms of the policy choices is that the government has to tell us what it wants us to assume its policy is towards public expenditure on public services and capital spending, so uh, the choices it makes about that. At the moment, we have detailed plans for public expenditure, department by department, set out only for 2015-16, which requires an assumption for the remaining four years of the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the forecast. And we ask the government what they want us to uh, assume about that. And we have been given an assumption, which we are assured is the uh, agreed view of the coalition uh, uh, as a whole, although both parties would say if they were governing alone that they would be doing uh, something uh, different. And the government has chosen not to tell us directly how much it wants to spend on public services, but to say how much it wants to spend in total. You can then subtract the forecast that we produce for things like debt, interest and welfare, and that leaves you with an implied envelope that's left over for public uh, services uh, spending. And there have been some, some significant changes on that. The government has uh, basically uh, increased slightly the squeeze on total public spending that it wants us to assume through until 2018-19, but has then dropped the idea of cutting total public spending as a share of GDP in the final year of the forecast, 2019-20. One consequence of which is that the implied profile for the change in spending on public services over the next five years, over the next parliament, uh, looks somewhat uh, uneven. Uh, we refer to it as a roller coaster in the, uh, in the report. Basically, you have a sharper real cut in public spending on, on public services in 2016, 17 and 17, 18 than anything that we've seen over the Parliament to date, but then that being put back into reverse in 2019, uh, 20. In terms of uh, rationale for this, that's obviously for the governments to say why they choose the, uh, the numbers that they do, but I think you can think of a number of things in terms of the shape of the public finance forecast as a whole that the government has achieved, for want of a better uh, word, and the consequences that's had. So one thing that it has done is it has ensured that our forecasts for borrowing are lower in every year to 2018-19 than they were in December, and that's achieved by tightening the, the, the squeeze in the middle. It is no longer the case that public spending is set to fall to its lowest share of GDP since the 1930s which was the case in the December forecast and now isn't because the additional cut in spending in the final year has been dropped. 
The government is also uh, still achieving with some uh, room for manoeuvre the fiscal targets that it set itself uh, as a rolling three-year target for a particular measure of the budget deficit, and that's one of the reasons why they've continued to pencil in the particularly sharp squeeze on spending in years two and three of the Parliament. And finally, they've also uh, managed to uh, see uh, debt as a share of GDP falling in 2015-16, a year earlier than in our December forecast, and they've achieved that by announcing additional asset sales, uh, the granite Northern Rock uh, securitization vehicle and more sales of uh, Lloyds Bank uh, shares. Now, I think it's important to point out with asset sales that if you sell an asset for roughly the present value of the future flow of income you're going to get in from it, that's not actually making the public finances better off. You're changing the flow of money that's, uh, that's coming in there. So it's worth noting that that brings in an additional £20 billion to reduce debt in 2015-16, but it also reduces, in effect, the government's income in the remaining years of the forecast by about £10 uh, billion. So, um, on the face of it, you might look at this profile for public services spending and think, why would you design it like that with a blank sheet of paper? But I think you have to bear in mind that there are, first of all, that there, there are various objectives for what they wanted the public finances forecast to look like, and that's what drops out as a consequence. And the second point is that this is the agreed policy of the coalition, but both parties, both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, have said that they would do different things if they were governing alone. The Conservatives, for example, have said that they wouldn't need to squeeze public services as much in the middle of the next Parliament because they would find more money from welfare cuts and from tax avoidance measures. Parliament, the UK Parliament, has instructed us not to look at the alternative policies of different parties, so I merely note that rather than commenting on it. OK, well, thank you very much for that fascinating introductory uh, statement and also for the documentation which uh, have been has been provided to committee members. I'm going to start uh, just on the, that, the asset sale. You said that uh, if this £20 billion of assets had not been sold, in, uh, the, the government would expect to raise about £10 billion in, in terms of uh, income as a, as a result of the asset had been retained. What kind of level of interest would it have to pay on the £20 billion debt, would you estimate, over, the, over those years? Uh, well, the, the effect of this is basically to, to reduce net debt by about £20 billion in total in 2015-16. So when it comes to asset sales, we set a relatively high hurdle in terms of being willing to put those in our forecast. You need to have a reasonable degree of certainty about what exactly it is that the government is intending to sell crucially when it is likely to sell it, i.e. in which financial years that is likely to take effect, uh, and then uh, to reach a judgment on the amount of money that it's likely to bring in. So we pressed the government for, you know, uh, if, you, if they wished us to include this in the forecast, we needed to have a reasonable amount of certainty around those things. However, that said, there always remains uncertainty about the impact of asset sales of that sort, because you obviously don't know what market conditions are going to be like in 2015-16, whether they will proceed with the sales as currently described. But, you know, we think they've been upfront enough about it and about the amounts of money that would be involved to, to put that there. So, uh, as I say, you have an upfront gain to the public finances of, of 20 billion ish uh, in, uh, in 2015 16, and then one of the consequences of that is that you're not getting the income that you would have done from those assets over the remainder of the forecast. That's about 10 billion over, as I say, the remaining years of the forecast, but then that would stretch on further into the future. And obviously, as I say, if at the end of the day you assume that you sell something for roughly what it's worth, uh, then, that's, uh, then that comes out in the wash at the end. So what this does is to temporarily reduce public sector net debt rather than to permanently reduce this. It's a change in the profile rather than automatic. I mean, the point I was trying to get at was, is would the interest that would have to be paid on that, on the, on the, that 20 billion be more or less than the 10 billion that the government would otherwise have received in terms of the uh, of income from the, the asset. I mean, I know the asset can possibly fall to 15 billion given market conditions, got to be 30 billion. Who knows? But I mean, just on, on current trends, how would that be? Um, I'm not sure what the what the uh, we will have taken that into account in the forecast. I'm not sure, given the amount and the level of interest rates, that the the, the sums would be would be uh, very large. 
uh, in aggregate terms for the, for the health of the public finances, but I can check whether we've got a firmer number on that and cut back to you. Yeah, because that would be interesting. The other thing, I was, it, you, you're talking about detailed expenditure plans, 15, 16, nothing beyond that, and that you were having to do some extrapolations. Um, uh, you know, and what you talked about, the implied envelope, is this a kind of a £12 billion that's been mooted? Uh, the, well, the £12 billion, uh, there's lots of £12 billion is around. Uh, one of the ones is that the, the Conservatives have said, as I say, we, we have plugged in the number that the Coalition has signed off together, but both of them have simultaneously said they would not, you know, that's not what they would do if they were governing alone. The Conservatives have said that they would like to find £12 billion of additional uh, welfare spending, which means that you wouldn't necessarily need to squeeze public services by as much as is implied in the central forecast that we have uh, at the moment. Uh, they haven't said where that would come. So we, we've not put that in the forecast for two reasons. One, it's not government policy, it's conservative policy. The second reason is that even if it was government policy, we would only put it in when it was explained how it would be done because that obviously affects the whole shape of the, uh, of the forecast. So um, uh, if that's the £12 billion you're referring to, it's, it's essentially the Conservatives saying, well, this is one of the ways in which we would depart from the, uh, what the Coalition has managed to agree together for this spending path. OK. Now, I've asked you the, uh, this question in previous years and asked the IM IFS the same question, more or less, uh, this year and indeed uh, last, which is uh, about productivity. Uh, you, you talk about another disappointing quarter for productivity growth, down revision to estimates of economic growth in 2014 and the world economy, and you touched on that in your opening uh, statement. And you also uh, talk about productivity falling on an hourly basis in the final quarter, falling short of a forecast once again. Why is... It's a, it's a sixty-four thousand dollars question. Why do, are we still continuing to see this uh, difficulty in terms of productivity, stubbornly refusing to rise? And, uh, and it, because obviously it's having a, a, a serious impact in terms of economic growth um, overall, and it's affecting um, the, 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 uh, the, the economy um, and competitiveness. So, so can you? Well, I'd love to say that we've cracked it since the last time you asked That's this, exactly this what the question. IFS said. <laughs> I was hoping you would be the font of all knowledge on this occasion and trying it one over on IFS. We're coming up. I mean, I realise it's not in here, but I'm just wondering if you've got any... Uh, there are, you obviously have some thoughts about why that should be. Yeah, I think, the, I think the main explanation to which most of us cling more than to any other, although I think given the, the, the scale of the shortfall from historical experience, uh, you have to assume that there must be a number of explanations adding up uh, here, um, the presumption that the difficulties uh, in the financial uh, system, credit conditions, the fact that the you know, largest banks aren't functioning as, uh, as they would do in normal times, is preventing the efficient reallocation of capital away from firms that would ordinarily shut under these circumstances to relatively young, potentially rapidly growing, uh, productive, uh, innovative, productive, younger uh, firms. Uh, and that that uh, hinders productivity growth, also hinders your ability to take advantage of the uh, you know, falls in the exchange rate uh, and, and in export markets. So one half of that argument is the, is the so-called zombie firms argument that, you know, as I say, some relatively unproductive firms don't go out of business because of a combination of interest rates being relatively low, wage growth being relatively low, banks being reluctant to pull the plug on them. And on the other hand, and my um, uh, macro, main macro colleague on the committee, I think would place more emphasis on this than on the zombie firms, is the inability of potentially rapidly growing innovative firms to get access to enough working capital and the ability to, uh, to expand. So that remains the, uh, the, the straw to which we all cling. Uh, as the main explanation. Uh, the Bank of England has devoted thousands of person hours to this and comes up with a long list of which that would be one of the main ones I think they would, uh, they would cite. But it is a very important uh, assumption and you know, we remain, we continue to assume that over time productivity growth will get back to the sorts of rates that you've seen historically and consequently that the potential output of the economy will return to the sorts of growth rates that we have uh, seen historically. And that's, you know, it is partly an act of faith on the assumption that there doesn't seem to be a very, you know, a, a firm evidence base for saying that's, that's not going to be uh, the case. 
However, there are different views on this. Some people would say, well, actually, we can expect productivity growth now to rebound relatively uh, rapidly. People are more confident than, than we are of that. There are some people who run the argument that, you know, we've had three industrial revolutions and that's your lot. Uh, and that you're not going to see productivity growth uh, reviving. We did, not in this forecast, but in the, uh, the previous one, um, some alternative scenarios basically saying what would the forecast look like if in one case you assume that rather than gradually recovering to the historical trend rate, you see the sort of improvement in productivity growth that you saw in the 1980s, and an alternative view which just says recent history continues and it remains uh, very depressed and, you know, uh, summarising uh, the bad outcome produces a bad outcome and the good outcome produces uh, a good outcome. If you have a weaker outlook for potential GDP, that's crucial in constraining the, the outlook for the fiscal position because basically if you kick a hole in the potential of the economy, you create an additional element of the budget deficit that's presumed to be structural and won't disappear as the, as, you know, the economy gets back to the normal level that the Bank of England, that is consistent with the bank, uh, hopefully successfully achieving the inflation target over time. So, uh, you know, maybe next time I'm here we will have cracked it, but that's as, uh, that's as good hopes. as we've got at the moment. I mean, I understand that productivity growth, you know, in the norm is about 1.4 per cent, but one would have thought productivity would have increased, certainly in the public sector, given the significant reduction in, in people in that uh, sector with, uh, with uh, demands uh, continuing to rise. So, as uh, much of it... Um, in the private sector. Another thing as well is, surely with 298,000 migrants, most of whom I would imagine be young and fairly dynamic, you know, working age population, that alone would, would, one would think, boost productivity. And on the back of that, can you tell me what kind of the GDP per capita growth is? Because, I mean, you're talking about uh, growth was forecast at 3%, it's now 26 but that's economic growth as opposed to per capita growth. I take it that's now lower, because obviously if the population is increasing, but the economy is not growing as fast as it should have been, then you're looking at a per capita GDP growth significantly less. Yeah, I mean, if you... Um, well, let's look at the impact of the, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the migration change on, on per capita uh, GDP as a starting point. I mean, if you, uh, as I say, we've, 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 we've shifted to what the ONS calls its principal population projection rather than the low migration population projection, which, as I say, is basically assuming 165,000 a year, getting to 165,000 a year rather than 105. If you look at the consequence that that has for potential GDP over the course of the, uh, of the aggregate growth rate over the course of the, uh, of the forecast, as a result of that, you revise it up by about 0.6 percentage points uh, as a consequence of the, the higher migration. 0.5 of that 0.6 simply reflects the fact that the population is going to be bigger. So that doesn't have an effect on uh, per capita GDP. There is an additional 0.1 of that 0.6, which reflects the fact that the employment rate is presumed to be higher as a consequence of this. And that relates to the fact that net inward migrants are more likely or tend to be more likely to be of working age than the population in general. So uh, uh, we, we make the assumption that uh, net inward migrants have the same productivity, the same age and gender-specific employment rates as the native population. But the consequence then of making that is that um, uh, the, um, the increase in the employment rate increases per capita GDP. It doesn't increase GDP per worker because it's, it's the fact that you're getting more workers per you know, chunk of the population out of the net inward migrants than you would do... Uh, than you would do otherwise. So there is an effect uh, there. And now I'm going to have to remind me what your initial question was on the productivity. Well, I was just saying that surely... Uh, the, the point I was trying to make was that surely... Oh, pro um, public sector. The, 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 yeah, the productivity, basically, one would imagine, has increased in the public sector because of the huge uh, decrease in the number of people in that in the public yeah. sector. And so, therefore, most of the productivity, I would think, uh, um, decline or stagnation would be in the private sector. Yes, I mean, it's an interesting... Uh, we had been surprised, and it took us longer than perhaps it should have done to catch up with the fact that uh, cutting public services spending, we assumed, would have more of a direct drag on GDP via the, the bit of GDP that is the government's consumption of goods and, and services than it, was, uh, than it was going to. And we've, um, uh, although 
overall growth has generally come in weaker than we've anticipated, we overestimated the size of the direct drag from the public spending cuts. And that is because of the way in which output and therefore productivity within the public sector is measured. So for a reasonably large chunk of public services, you measure the output of those services directly, but relatively simply with things like number of children being educated, number of operations taking place. So if you look, for example, at education, because uh, the government has not responded to uh, a, uh, an X percent cut in spending on education by saying we will uh, educate X percent fewer children, but rather it's changed the overall quality and quantity of, of, of educational services, but it's not shown up in the measure of direct output, then actually uh, it's not dragged that down. And it does, as you say, it shows up in productivity, shows up in the price uh, mix. And it's taken us uh, a while to realise that that would be the case. So if you go back a few forecasts, we would have been assuming that uh, the... Um, uh, that the, the cuts would have been a greater drag from that source than they've actually tended to be in the measured numbers. That's a different question, however, from is the overall fiscal consolidation having the impact on the economy that you would anticipate? That's a broader question, bringing in what's going on in the, in the public sector, uh, in the private sector as well as the public sector. But you're right to highlight the fact that, there's, uh, that the link has not been straightforward and shows up you know, in a relatively good productivity performance. Yes, there. I'm, not, I'm not going to ask any further on this, but one would have thought that just advancing technology alone would help boost productivity, which has done in, uh, over um, previous uh, years and generations, and maybe a further leap in technology will, will itself take things forward. It, it depends a lot on, in the end, how you measure the output. Mm. Uh, so this is not to deny that you know, the cuts may not be having broader effects or those sort of effects there. But if you, if for the purposes of the national accounts, measure the output of education as being number of children being educated, a lot of those things just don't show up. OK, thank you for that. Now, um, you say in 148 of the Economic and Fiscal Outlook Executive Summary, it's considerable uncertainty around our central forecast. And I want to move on to um, Scotland in, in, in that regard. Uh, in terms of the forecasts with the, the, the Scottish rate of income tax, of course, which is going to be um, introduced from April uh, for well, year to day, um, the, the forecasts um, uh, have changed quite uh, markedly um, over the years. I mean, for example, um, the forecast for 2016-17 um, has fallen by 18 per cent since your March. Uh, 2012 uh, forecast, which is obviously quite significant. But at this stage, um, the forecast is now that um, the receipts will uh, grow um, from 4.379 to 5.748 billion, which is a 30% increase over five years in the Scottish rate of income tax. And in terms of other forecasts, um, you, you know, there's been significant uh, changes uh, in terms of. Um, uh, you know, uh, a 15 per cent reduction just since December in your prediction for um, uh, land bills and traction tax uh, for the same year, 1617, from 600 to 510 million. Uh, but, but again, over the period 1415 to 1920, you're actually predicting a 90 per cent increase in receipts there. And overall, um, you're predicting a total increase in tax receipts and the devolved taxes of 35% over five years, which does seem to me, um, you know, quite significant in terms of the overall the background economic growth that we're talking about, you know, back maybe two and a half, three percent growth. So first of all, I wonder if you can explain to me, um, some of it is actually in the documentation, but for the record, apart from anything else, but explain to me why there's been significant uh, changes to your forecasting uh, over the last three years, indeed in the last quarter with regard to LBTT, and why you're so optimistic about these um, tax forecasts. I mean, I think we'd all be delighted if they came, they came true, but a 35% increase in, in, in tax receipts in Scotland in five years does seem pretty optimistic. Sure. I think in, um, in both cases, if you're looking at the changes over time, most of those are the consequence of changes in the UK forecast as distinct from uh, changes in the Scottish share, if, for example, if you take the, uh, the SRIT uh, forecast. I think the, um, on the income tax story, um, the key, di I mean, it's coming back in part to the sort of productivity puzzle that we were talking about uh, a moment ago. 
what you've seen is uh, a fall in the effective tax rate. So you can be wrong about the amount of income tax you're going to bring in because you're wrong about the amount of income. But you can also be wrong about the income tax forecast because you're wrong about the, you know, the amount of income tax you're going to bring in per pound of wages and salaries. And there's an element... Sorry, and I do appreciate that the UK uh, changes to personal allowance has had an impact on this in terms of the previous forecast as well. Uh, yes, that's true. Yes, the policy changes subsequent mm -hmm. to that. And it's also, of course, an important driver of what's going on with the Scottish share mm -hmm. looking forward as, as well. But in terms of what, you know, why the income tax forecasts have, have disappointed, it's partly a consequence of the fact that we have, uh, we have continued to be surprised by the fact that wage growth has not picked up, but employment, so wage growth has been weaker than expected and employment growth has been stronger than expected, uh, which is another way, way of manifestation of the productivity puzzle. Uh, it's generally the case that if you see uh, labour income, wages and salaries rising by £10 billion, the exchequer gets more bang for that buck if that's as a consequence of everybody's wages going up by 10% than it is if the amount of employment goes up by 10%. And the reason for that is that if wage growth is relatively strong throughout the income distribution is it pulls people's income, more of people's incomes into higher tax brackets, a process called fiscal drag which you normally rely upon to raise the average tax rate year in, year out. And that's an important reason why you see the income tax numbers you know, rising if you look forward into the future. But that's not happened in part because of this, uh, uh, this change. So if employment growth rises rather than wage growth, you may end up with a larger number of people on relatively low incomes not paying very much more tax rather than helping to drive people up through higher tax rates. So that's one reason. In addition, the employment growth, which has been stronger than expected, has not been as tax rich as one would have anticipated. Some of it has been in self-employment and the evidence suggests that the uh, increase in self-employment, that these have been uh, self-employed jobs that are paying less than self-employed jobs normally do on average. And so for that reason as well, you have the, uh, the average tax rate, the effective tax rate being, uh, being weaker, and that's uh, a manifestation of this. So if you then say why is that expected to pick up looking forward, partly it comes back to our assumption that we will get back to a position in which you have more historically normal rates of productivity growth and associated with that more normal rates uh, of uh, wage growth and that that will return you to fiscal drag and help to raise the average tax rate uh, as you go uh, forward. You also have the fact that because inflation is lower than anticipated, the uprating of allowances and thresholds is less than it otherwise would be, which means that you don't have to travel as far to get people over those higher rates. And that's another reason for having a relatively robust growth rate for receipts uh, looking forward. But the, the key judgment on which this depends uh, is uh, whether you uh, get back to um, the sorts of rates of productivity growth and earnings growth that we have seen uh, in the past. In terms of the, as I say, I think most of the story has been on the UK forecast. If you look at the Scottish share uh, specifically, the Scottish share, as we've discussed before, has been relatively stable over quite a period, a little over 3%, uh, but has then declined, and we assume that it will continue to decline in the future. And that's primarily, as you say, as a consequence of the policy changes that have been announced. You've had revenue-raising measures at the top, the additional rate of income tax, some of the other, the, the withdrawal of the personal allowance at relatively high rates. And at the bottom, you've had the personal allowance being raised, narrowing the tax base at that level. So because this has made the, uh, the income tax system more reliant on the incomes of the people towards the top, and because of the difference in the income distribution between Scotland and the rest of the UK, that basically helps explain what's driving uh, with, the, uh, with the share there. Um, in terms of the LBTT, um, one of the reasons that we've moved down, and this is true for, again for the, the rest of the UK, the SDLT system there and for the Scottish system, is that we've revised down our assumption about the, uh, the level, the, the normal level of transactions, the frequency with which people move and buy and sell houses. 
uh, relative to what we've had in uh, before. And we basically, uh, again, look at a, a number of years and try to derive a historical average to which you return. And we've looked back and thought that maybe the years we were averaging, averaging over, some of them weren't particularly representative, and we've shifted that there. Now, with LBTT, uh, because the thresholds are assumed to be fixed, there's been no announcement about indexing them, you again have this issue of fiscal drag. If you have house prices uh, increasing, it's pulling more, more transactions into relatively higher uh, bits of the, uh, of the system. Uh, and you also have the assumption that in addition to house prices recovering, that you have transactions recovering back to this albeit lower assumed uh, historical norm. So it's not unusual for um, stamp duty LBTT type taxes to have quite big ups and downs because it's not merely driven by what's happening to prices, it's driven by what's happening to transactions as well. Uh, an additional uh, twist on this is that the consequence of moving to the slice systems on both sides of the border is that you would expect to get more fiscal drag out of the new systems than you did out of the old one because the average tax rate goes on rising at the top rather than being capped at the highest slab rate. So uh, as the value of the transaction gets higher and higher, the average tax rate is asymptoting towards the highest uh, uh, marginal uh, rate. Uh, and I think this is, I mean, it's, it's a, it poses an interesting issue for us, for the Fiscal Commission as, as well, I think, that the, this new structure is going to mean that the amount of receipts you get from LBTT uh, and from SDL and from the, the similar structure of SDLT in the rest of the UK becomes increasingly dependent on the number of transactions taking place for relatively highly priced properties. And that is a, always a hard adjustment to have to make. We, you know, have always, you know, it's not simply a question of coming up with a macroeconomic forecast that tell you average house prices, we assume, will do the following. But in the UK context, we always have to worry about whether London is doing something different from the rest of the UK uh, and adjusting for that. So looking back, we've basically seen a period and we have assumed that there was a period in which London would outperform the rest of the country. That seems to have you know, dissipated, and we're not assuming that that's the case looking forward. But I think even for doing the forecast for LBTT, you would have to be concerned not merely about what the average performance of house prices is going to be across Scotland, but what's going to happen in particular areas where you have relatively high house prices. And it's striking that the housing market as a whole, Scotland, in terms of the movement in the average house price, doesn't look very different from the rest of the UK ex London, and indeed looks more similar to the rest of UK ex London than, for example, Wales, Northern Ireland, North East uh, England do. So I suspect that when the, the Scottish Government and the Fiscal Commission are looking at the LBTT forecasts over time, uh, and, uh, and, and we do as well, you know wondering whether there are particular reasons for more highly priced properties uh, to perform differently from the rest will be quite an important consideration. And that may not be down to, entirely down to what's going on in the macro forecast. I'm not an expert in this area, but my guess would be that the number of uh, or the movement or the behaviour of relatively highly priced properties in the Aberdeen area might be, have as much to do with what's going on in the oil sector as it does with the overall macro picture. Okay. I'm going to let my colleagues in just a minute. I'm just going to ask uh, one one uh, thing further. I mean, I mean, I understand that you're unable to produce a Scottish macroeconomic forecast, um, you know, because um, the macroeconomic forecast and economic determinants are generally not available at Scottish level, or only after a, a long kind of lag. Is that, that the case still? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what kind of lag are we talking about in terms of being able to assess Scottish figures? I think it varies from, from statistic to statistic. I'm sure um, the Fiscal Commission colleagues would be uh, more up to speed on, on that. I think, as I say, the, whether, whether in some of the sensitivities, it's the elements. I mean, clearly, if you wanted to take a very different view about what was going to happen to the path of labour income, what was going to happen to the prices of average house prices, that's something that you would derive out of a... Uh, of a, you know, you could do a macroeconomic forecast which would shed light on that, but that wouldn't get you away from, as I say, the other sorts of judgments you have to make as well 
in particular, so for example, on the income tax forecast, once you've got a macroeconomic forecast, we have to worry about you know, whether policy measures are resulting in forestalling, whether there's something particularly unusual going on with the distribution and size of bonuses in the financial sector and outside the financial sector in the uh, LBTT and SDLT forecast, you worry about whether there's something different going on with relatively highly priced properties versus other properties. If you're looking at landfill, there's clearly you know, policy questions as much as you know, macro questions of if you come up with a macro forecast, that gives you some sense of what's going to happen to landfill. So, um, you know, it, clearly, if you had a completely fully articulated, up-to-date Scottish macro forecast, that would be a useful input to put into these things. But there would still be a lot of awkward, you know, uh, things you would have to take judgments on on a forecast by forecast basis. Uh, that means that even that wouldn't get you the whole way. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, the first colleague to ask questions will be Malcolm. Thank you. I, I realise you've got to be even less political than you. You never are political, of course, but uh, we, t we tend to be getting pulled in the opposite direction. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I, you're, you're, one of your most quoted sound bites uh, has been about the roller coaster profile, and I, and I suppose that certainly, um, spite uh, the, the accusation that spending levels were returning to 1930s levels, but um, I suppose. And you probably can't comment on that, but I'm interested in the, the, the fact that the, there's, the squeeze has increased slightly till 2018. I mean, is that a significant change from previously, or is that... Um, and I'm, I'm not quite clear what the reason for that be, unless it's to create a roller coaster. Uh, it's not an enormous change. Uh... What it effect, in effect means, as I say, because the government has chosen to... You know, to, to, uh, to tell us what to assume about public services spending by coming up with a rule that, or rather a, uh, an assumption that describes what happens to overall spending over this period and then backing out the implied profile for uh, public services spending. That rule has now become quite complicated. Back in 2011, the government gave us an assumption for what should happen to public spending beyond the period for which there were detailed plans, and we could explain it in our document in 29 words. Uh, the rule has now become sufficiently complicated that it takes us 428 words to explain it. So that gives you, you know, some sense of how much effort has gone into getting the profile that they want. What in practice this has meant is that um, because of what's happened to inflation and interest rates in the forecast, the debt, uh, the, um, the debt interest payment forecast has come down quite a lot. And essentially what the government has said in the way that it's expressed the, uh, the, um, the assumption to us is that we want to bank some of that in a way that reduces the budget deficit and perhaps not uncoincidentally reduces the budget deficit to slightly lower than it was in the forecast that we produced in December, and the rest of it effectively loosens the implied squeeze on public services spending. So over that period, the roller coaster is somewhat less roller coastery than it would otherwise uh, have been. Um, as I say, the uh, the I think if you're looking for the sort of the explanation for why that that pattern. Uh, looks as it does. It's the combination of, you know, wanting to have borrowing lower in most years than in the previous forecast, wanting to achieve a particular amount of fiscal consolidation by 2017-18, and not wanting to have public spending hitting the lowest, a, a post-war low at the end of the process. That once you've achieved all of those things by the 428 words explaining where the overall profile for spending is, that the, the roller coaster is what drops out as the consequence for public services spending. It's not that the government has said this is the path of real changes in spending on public services that we think makes sense for the planning of public uh, expenditure. Obviously, uh, you know, as I say, both parties would say that they would do different things that meant that the pattern wouldn't look like that if they were governing alone. Uh, the key point, though, is that this is now the baseline for whichever party or parties do come into power after the election, and if they don't want it to look like that, they're going to have to explain what they would diff do differently, and then we will come back and tell you what the, uh, what the path looks like as a consequence of that. So, um, uh, it, as I say, the, the working assumption is that at some point in the autumn of this year, uh, 
uh, the new government is going to have to say what it wants, the, you know, to set out some detailed plans or the envelope for the detailed plans over some years into the future. What we don't know is how many years into the future, and that, of course, may depend in part on, you know, what the government looks like um, after the election. Another, um, I don't think it's not quite such a striking sound bite, but it has been quoted by various commentators when you said the coalition government's politicians in this budget are not expected to have a material impact on the economy, which might be thought to be surprising in terms of the purpose of a budget. But uh, although the government has been lucky in terms of uh, lower oil prices in terms, and lower inflation, well, at one level, I'm not obviously lucky for Scotland, but... Um, um, the, you also say the economy is ending 2014 in a weaker uh, state than expected, and then there's, there were some figures for January yesterday which suggest it might be even weaker. So I don't know uh, whether you can comment any of that in terms of looking forward, or, or, or are you still fairly optimistic about uh, the growth of the economy? Well, it, you know, this is a central forecast, and we haven't updated it since the, uh, uh, since the budget. I think the latest numbers that have come out on the GDP front, although they do show higher growth on average uh, over 2014, uh, so you know, we had the downward revisions which have been partially reversed. The main reason for the change in the calendar year is because there was a small upward revision to uh, GDP, I think, in the first quarter of 2014. I'm not sure the numbers that came out yesterday tell us anything terribly different about the, the momentum at the moment. Uh, the fourth quarter GDP growth rate was revised up a tad, but the third quarter was revised down. I think the index of services was perhaps slightly weaker than anticipated in January. So I don't think that you would look at that and say there was a particularly different you know, momentum story arising out of those revisions. In terms of the judgment that we made that the... Uh, that the policies didn't have a, were unlikely to have a material effect. That's partly a reflection, as I said, of the fact that this is yet another package in which the aggregate size of the giveaways broadly offsets the aggregate size of the takeaways. And it's quite hard to produce a policy package that does have a dramatic effect on the economy for which that is also uh, the case. So we've not um, made any dramatic changes to the growth profile as a consequence of this. Um, you do in, uh, look at individual policies. So, for example, you could argue that the subsidy for first-time buyers is something that's likely to push up uh, house prices. You'd expect that. It's increasing demand, not doing do very much for supply, pushing that up. Um, but... Um, but we've made the assumption that the, the magnitude of that policy change is not large enough to, to materially change the, the forecast. Um, I mean, one obvious difference is that the, and this is not a policy change, although policy partially reverses it, is the decline in oil production assumed through the forecast you know, does make a difference in terms of the, the overall uh, GDP path. And we've basically assumed that um, the the tax measures that were announced in the budget rever would, would reverse or ameliorate about a third of the decline in production that you would otherwise have anticipated merely from what's gone on with the oil price over that period. So, you know, for the oil sector, that's, that's material, but in terms of the macro picture, it's not necessarily. Now, the fallout from the fiscal mandate is much discussed uh, in Scotland. Um, the, the first part of it in particular, the, the aim to achieve cyclically adjusted current balance by the end of the third year of the rolling five-year forecast period. And you're obviously quite confident in your report that you understand that, but other people in the debate in the House of Commons, which is uh, much quoted as well in Scotland, um, really uh, said this was all rather obscure, particularly, I suppose, cyclically adjusted and rolling, uh, but you're quite confident that you know what that means. <laughs> uh, I think so, uh, and we've certainly produced a forecast and a judgment on whether they're going to hit it or not on that basis. Um, I mean, the distinction here, I mean, the, what is being targeted, this is basically another way of putting this, is to say that you want the government to be raising enough in revenue to cover its spending on things other than capital investment. That's what balancing the current budget uh, means. 
cyclically adjusted means, you know, that you would want that to be the case if the economy was running at a Goldilocks level that was neither too hot nor too cold. We are assuming that there will still be a little bit of spare capacity in the economy uh, in 2017, uh, which would uh, marginally make the, uh, uh, the, uh, the underlying position look, look worse. Um, but we've not got very much spare capacity. So the difference between cyclically adjusted and non-cyclically adjusted is becoming smaller as that gap closes. Uh, the rolling uh, nature of the forecast, uh, the government has, and, and uh, you know, it, it's true in the, new, in the new framework, it was true in the old one, you have one target that is at a fixed date. So until the end of last year, they wanted the debt-to-GDP ratio to fall in 2015-16, and it doesn't matter when you do the forecast, it was always 2015-16. They've now changed that to 16-17, but again, it's 16-17. In terms of the, uh, achieving the, uh, the cyclically adjusted uh, uh, current budget balance, that is rolling in the sense of every year, every time we do a forecast, they want that to be true in the third year of the forecast. So every year, we roll the forecast forward another year, and that target then rolls forward into the future. Now, the rationale for that would be that if you kept that uh, st uh, stuck at a particular date, you could end up having to make some very, very dramatic policy changes with a year to go, uh, and that, in fact, it's better to keep your eyes focused on the, the medium term. Now, there's a, the government has decided to shrink that horizon over which it's looking from five to three years. Some people would argue that you would have been better sticking off with five. Some people uh, would prefer a fixed date, but that's what they've chosen to do, and that's what we have to stick to. But it is one of the reasons, presumably, why you still have this relatively tight squeeze in years two and three of the Parliament, because that's what helps determine what the deficit is in 2016-17. But then when we roll the forecast forward another year, the target year will move from 1617 to 1780. Um, now, obviously, at one level, you can say, well, that's fine. You're always saying jam tomorrow, but you never deliver the jam today. Uh, what we do, of course, though, is to explain what was going on with the old versions of the targets as well as the new. So it will be entirely transparent in the analysis that we've done as to whether you're simply shifting the promised land one year further into the future or whether you've continued to deliver on it in the earlier years. So now the government obviously changed its fiscal mandate because I mean, it's just current now, and I think it was, it was more than, than current before. So... I mean, do you, do, again, I don't know if you can comment on this, but, but do you feel that the, in order to reach that mandate, the, it, we require to have the squeeze that we're having? Uh, presumably, um, well, and I suppose a related question for me on that, given it's current now, could, do you know how much of capital expenditure is financed uh, by current expenditure? We could presume that's relevant to whether it hits the target or not, if, since capital expenditure could be exempted from the, from the fiscal mandate now? Uh, well, uh, to start with, the thing that they're targeting hasn't changed. That was all that was current before, it's current now. The only thing that has changed is that it's moved from year five to year three. So that's, that's not, uh, that's not uh, changed. Um, in terms of the, the forecasts, we are doing these on the basis of the national accounts definition of what constitutes capital versus current. So, you, you know, it is certainly true sort of local authorities, you can have, you know, rules about whether you're allowed to use current, spend, uh, current income to, to finance capital spending, but we are essentially looking at what is the total magnitude of non-investment spending, what is the total magnitude of receipts, and comparing the two on a national accounts basis, so there shouldn't be that scope for, uh, for gaming uh, in that sort of way. There is a debate, obviously, about whether, you know, the distinction between current and capital spending is the right sort of thing to be worrying about if your argument is that you're happy to borrow for things that have a benefit for future generations and therefore it's worthwhile borrowing for that and future generations can help pay for it by helping to service the debt that you raise then people might argue you know, why would you be happier to, uh, to do that for some areas of capital spending that might not actually deliver great value for money, but you're not prepared to do that for training teachers and doctors, which does have a long-term uh, uh, benefit. Um, 
you know, that's a question of how you should you design the rule. It's one that's not for us to, to comment on, but, but people would, would look at that, and the government has chosen to, uh, to, um, to set the rule in this way. It is, of course, common to the golden rule that was under the Labour government previously, and again, the rationale being at the time that if you do end up in a situation where there needs to be a squeeze, you don't necessarily want capital spending to bear an undue uh, proportion of that squeeze. Uh, in practice, when times get tough, governments often cut what they can, not necessarily what they should, uh, and uh, th those are the consequences that come out. And I'm not saying that's happening in this particular case, but it's, you know, it's one of the shared rationales for making uh, that, sort of, uh, that sort of distinction, although other people would say, you know, maybe that is or isn't the right thing to be targeting, but we have to police them against the targets that they've chosen to be policed against. But, but just to be clear, so, but you're saying if, if you spend current or resource um, money on capital, you would classify that as capital expenditure. That, that's what you said? Yes, I mean, we, we, well, uh, you know, the, the capital depends on what you're spending. Yeah, well, on, well I know, but, but that's very important because presume, I, that's why I wanted to know how much I mean, we're very familiar with this in terms of the Scottish budget, but in terms of, of spending resource on capital, uh, I just wondered how much across the UK that, that applied, because that's very relevant to whether you meet the fiscal mandate or not, because if you, if, if you then borrowed for that capital, you would obviously free up that resource or current expenditure for current services. Yes, I think in the national account sense, you're taking a step back from that and saying the government sets out detailed plans for what it is going to spend on capital and what it is going to spend on current, and then it basically has a set of plans to bring in revenue, which are, you know, which is being spent on both of those things and on servicing debt, paying for the welfare system, etc. So. Uh, in terms of policing this against the way the national accounts does, it's not, you know, we're not looking at what particular bits of revenue are paying for particular bits of expenditure. There's a whole lot of revenue that comes in, and then their government has spending plans, some of which is plans to spend on capital, some of which is planned to spend on current. Uh, and in terms of the fiscal rule, what we're looking at is whether you know, the government is basically raising enough in revenue to pay for the, for the, uh, the current resource bit of it. Yeah, but it would make a difference because if you were spending that resource on teachers and nurses, etc., and were borrowing, you would then have um, the same amount of capital expenditure, but you would have... Um, oh, so you're saying you couldn't get around that because, you, you, because yeah. you would have... The government, in effect, decides um, this is what we want to um, spend on capital, um, this is what we want to spend on current, um, and we're bringing in some money simultaneously. Um, is it bringing in... An, you know, we're obviously comparing both, so in the aggregate budget deficit, you're saying, are they bringing in enough revenue to pay for both of these things? In judging the current budget, you're saying, are they bringing in enough revenue to pay for the non-investment bit of this? OK, thanks, anyway. OK, okay thank you. Uh, Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I think a couple of points I wanted to ask about, uh, one being inflation. I mean, you do uh, mention uh, a number of times about... Um, CPI inflation to return to the government's 2% target relatively slowly, and elsewhere um, we expect inflation to remain below 1.5% until the end of 2016. I mean, I had a kind of gut feeling that inflation would you know, jump up again at some stage, but I've obviously got that wrong. Um, so it does seem to be quite low at the moment. I mean, would it matter if inflation you know, went negative? And 0.1%, say negative 0.1%, you know, some tiny amount, would that have a kind of psychological impact or would it have any real impact or have you looked at that at all? Well, as I say, I think our working assumption is, which seems to be being brought out in the data at the moment, is on consumer price inflation, basically you're heading to, you know, averaging fractionally above zero on a quarterly basis and that's entirely consistent with it being negative year on year in some months. I think the consensus view is that, you know, if you do end up with a bit of deflation of that sort, it's of the relatively benign kind of deflation that reflects the fact that, in particular, the oil price has declined quite a lot. That, you know, reduces the amount that households have got to spend on fuel, means that their rest of their income goes further. That temporarily boosts consumption and is a positive for, uh, for economic activity, albeit temporarily. Looking further into the future, the path of consumer spending depends much more on whether you get the productivity growth, wage growth that is a sustainable 
uh, uh, source of that. Where I think people would worry much more is if you get into a situation in which psychologically people assume that inflation is going to remain negative, prices are going to fall over time, which then encourages people to say, I won't spend today because it'll be cheaper to spend tomorrow, and that becomes a vicious uh, cycle. I think the, ex you know, the people's presumption at the moment is that isn't, isn't likely to be the case. It's not what we have in our forecast. One reason for that is if you look at what we're assuming about the path of the oil price, uh, we take uh, the, the, the oil price path that we plug into the forecast is essentially, you know, obviously the spot price today, what the futures curve is telling you about prices over the next couple of years, and then we hold it constant at that point thereafter, basically because you know, the IMF and others suggest that the, the, the futures market is not liquid enough to be providing you much useful information beyond that point. So what we have in the, in the implied movement of the oil price is a sharp fall relative to our December forecast, but one which is partially reversed over the next couple of years. So that also, when you map it through to the forecast we have for, for consumer price inflation, is it drops down sharply to zero, but then after a year, the base effect of the lower oil price and the lower fuel price drops out, and it's no longer pulling the inflation rate down. So inflation kicks back up again relatively quickly to about 1% uh, from zero. And then, as you say, we have it moving relatively slowly back towards the government's uh, and the Bank of England's 2% target by the end of the, uh, end of the forecast. Now, it's not... Uh, I think the bank may have it moving back more quickly, but the difference is really nothing to get excited about. You're back to about one8 by 2018, uh, I think we're assuming that the lagged effect of movements in the exchange rate is one reason why you won't expect it to snap uh, straight back. But, um, you know, I, I think a key reason that most people would see this as the benign form of, of, of deflation is that you're having an assumed one-off temporary gain from the reduction in the oil price, which isn't going to go on and on and on falling. Uh, your price is now, and the futures curve is slightly lower now, I think, than it was when we did the forecast, but not dramatically uh, so. And so for that reason, you're not projecting inflation being negative for an extended period of time, and in, the, in particular in the sort of way that central bankers and others would worry about as being a sort of deflationary spiral. Okay, I mean, you linked it in what you were saying and also in the, in the written uh, evidence about... Um the inflation being linked to sterling's uh, value. I mean, presumably a lot of that is out with our control, so that, that would depend largely on, you know, how does China's economy do, how does the state's economy do, that kind of thing. It, so I guess that is quite hard to predict as well? Yes, again, I mean, well, in, in terms of the exchange rate, uh, we assume that the exchange rate moves in line with the relationship between expected levels of interest rates in different countries and that there's a, there's a response there. So we're not making any particular judgments over the exchange rate. It drops out of, uh, you know, where the exchange rate is now, where the expected levels of interest rates are going to be uh, in uh, different countries. Uh, in terms of the effect of all of this on the, the fiscal position... I mean, obviously, different measures of inflation matter in different parts of the forecast. So consumer price inflation will matter, for example, in the uprating of income tax bans. Uh, retail price inflation will matter for the cost of index-linked gilts and for the uprating of excise duties. So the mapping from what's going on with inflation to what goes on in the fiscal forecast is not entirely, uh, is not entirely straightforward. OK. And you've also mentioned oil prices, which was the other point I wanted to touch on. Um, I mean, I don't think, as far as I can see, anybody had predicted the kind of fall when it happened. Uh, people were arguing over what the price would be, and then it, it, it kind of seemed to fall below everybody's expectation. I mean, have we learned from that, or were there lessons to learn about predicting the oil price, or does it continue to be just incredibly difficult, and again, probably linked to, say, the Chinese economy and how much they're using and things like that? I think it's, you know, it's very difficult. If I could predict it accurately, I wouldn't be, I'd be <laughs> doing something much more remunerative instead. Uh, I think the lesson I draw from this, which is the lesson that I think you know, I've said when we've discussed particularly the oil receipts forecast in the past, is that you know, this is a highly uncertain and very mobile forecast, and you have a very volatile path for receipts. And the lesson I would draw from this is that, you know, that forecast could have been wrong in the opposite direction, and you one has to make plans on the basis that this is something that is affected 
uh, you know, not you know, by, the, um, by the oil price, by what's going on with production, by what's going on with the level of investment in the industry. You know, it's, uh, it's not the most volatile of the receipts paths by some distance for nothing. There are a whole variety of reasons for that. Uh, and, you know, the swings can be quite large over periods. We've seen oil receipts drop from 12, roughly 12 to roughly 1 billion a year. We then saw them go back up to roughly 12 billion since when they've dropped back probably down to about 1 billion uh, a year. Uh, the oil price is obviously driven by global demand and supply, by particular geopolitical factors, by you know, what's going on with uh, particular suppliers. Uh, and I think the best that we can do is to say, you know, it's not for us, I think, to try to, or rather, you know, we could try to second-guess the futures market, but I think this is probably the best we've got to go on. Uh, as you know, when we do our longer-term projections, we go into quite a lot of effort to explain what the differences would be if you had different assumptions, looking at a range of forecasts for the, uh, for the oil price and seeing what impact that would have. But this is a very volatile receipt stream. The forecast errors are enormous. And I think the lesson to draw from that is that, you know, we're unlikely to move to a point at which this is, you know, trivial to, uh, to forecast in the future. And whoever is getting those receipts has to plan on that basis. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, Gavin, to be followed by Mark. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Robert. Good morning. Um, if we come on to the devolved taxes first, um, one that hasn't been touched on so far is uh, landfill tax. Um, I did have a load of questions ready, and then I saw that you'd published an addendum or a slight change to the, to the original. So can you tell us, I guess, just in broad terms, based on the, the, the change you made, what is roughly happening to landfill tax in Scotland over the next couple of years? Um, the, where are we? Um, we have the, the landfill tax moving from about... Uh, 103 a million in 2014, dropping down to about 90, uh, and then uh, picking up a little bit uh, further uh, after that. So it ends up at 99 million by the uh, by the end of the uh, forecast. So that's a somewhat more optimistic view. As I say, um, uh, there was an error in the initial forecast on basically on how the DEFRA projections for waste were being interpreted into this, and it's moved it. Uh, it's moved it back, but the um, the downward there is, you know, fundamentally is still a downward revision in the forecast since uh, December. That reflects the fact primarily that receipts in 2014-15 came in lower than anticipated, and that pushes through uh, the remainder uh, of the forecast. Uh, there's a lower projection now for the proportion of local authority waste that is set, uh, sent to landfill. That's based on the, the DEFRA projections suggesting a, a steeper fall uh, in the near term. So you have that pushing in one direction. On the other hand, you have our assumption that uh, the tax rates are raised uh, in line with RPI inflation. Uh, so you have the things pushing in both directions. And uh, towards the end of the forecast, you're assuming a flatter trend in waste sent to landfill. I think with the Scottish Government, I mean, we've again sort of looking at the shares of uh, receipts coming in, so we're not basing this on an explicit assumption that landfill moves in line with government targets uh, here or anywhere else, which I think may be the case in the Scottish Government forecast. Okay. I mean, obviously this forecast goes up to 1920, but I mean, lo longer term, do you see it as being a tax that's going to eventually diminish over time? Because presumably if we get to zero waste at, at some point, it becomes pretty close to nil. But do you think that will happen over time, or is that just not something you've... you've well, it at? obviously depends crucially on what the policy setting sure. is thereafter. So if you're basically seeing uh, the amount of landfill relatively steeply declining, there's a choice about whether you raise the, the, the tax rate in order to offset that and how far you want to go with that before you decide that the tax rates are, are too high. So what we've done here in the absence of fully articulated uh, policy towards this is to assume that it rises with, with RPI inflation. Uh, obviously, if different choices were made, you could slow that decline, um, presumably, um, as a consequence. Okay, thank you. Um, you've been asked a couple of questions about LBTT already, but just if we can return to that briefly. Um, you think... Your projections for commercial LBTT have been revised upwards slightly since your December forecast. 
yes, I suspect that's on the basis of latest information on prices and transactions, um, such as we have to go on. Um, but the residential LBTT has been revised down, and you put, you put four reasons, or there, there are four. It's, it's your table 3.3. Um, we have four changes. Change in LBTT rates minus 47. So is that, is that the fact that the government, Scottish Government changed the thresholds post? Because I guess you're post the December. The December, yeah, December, December forecast one was had the original yeah. okay. ones that were announced at the time of the draft budget, and then okay. we've taken on board the new, uh, the new ones Mr Spinney announced. Okay. Um, Modelling changes, what, is, what does that mean? Um, that, well, that generally is a sort of variety of uh, taking on board what the latest data is telling you about things going through the date, plus just literally looking at uh, the nature of the model, where there are particular wrinkles in it or ways that you can adjust things better than you otherwise would do. But that, as you can see, is relatively small. Okay. Property transactions down 37 million. So that's, that's based on... Yes, this is, comes back to the question yeah. that the, the convener asked earlier. So we've basically made an assumption that the rate of property transactions to which we return in the medium term is somewhat lower than we had previously assumed sure, because we sure. looked at the years that we were averaging that over. I think, again, with the Scot relative to the Scottish Government, we're, we're, we're both assuming a, a long-term transactions rate of around 5 to 6 per cent, so we may be a bit lower than them, but not dramatically, I think. OK. And just the, the bit you have at 3.15, um, your forecast takes into account the bringing forward of some higher price transactions, some delayed transactions at the <laughs> lower end. So I think you're saying SDLT is up by 11 million in 1415 and your LBTT goes down by 20 million in 15, 16. Just the, the 20 million point, that's re a reduction, whereabouts in your um, table 3.3 is that, f which, which, you know, is that a change in rates, presumably it's not modelling, is that property transactions, or is, it, is that 20 million split across different categories there, or is it all lumped into one? Uh, I assume that's in change in LBTT rates. It's certainly not in property transactions or house prices. Sure, okay. It might right. possibly be in modelling, but I think it's probably in, in, the, uh, okay. uh, in the other one. I mean, this is, I mean, this is basically as a consequence of the, the, the rates being announced some time sure. before they were being implemented. We have to assume, and this was a painful experience from the changes in the higher rate of income tax, that you know, when people know about changes in tax rates well in advance and it's something that they can change the timing sure. at which they might pay for it, then there's an incentive to do so. Sure. OK. Fine. And just in terms of um, going forward, I mean, maybe you've not been asked anything yet, but I mean, have, have you been sort of formally asked by government at any point to look at the Smith taxes or is that something that just hasn't crossed your, officially crossed your path yet? Uh, not yet. No, um, no. And it's something, obviously, that uh, I wait with keen interest to see what it's all going to, uh, to end up looking like. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we can do that as best we can. Uh, I mean, obviously, in terms of, you know, how all of this stuff evolves, the complexity of the job will depend an awful lot on the degree to which the devolution of these things actually results in different policy. Uh, as you, and obviously, you know, Scotland's had the right to move the income tax rate for a while and hasn't done so, so the issue about, well, what would you assume was the behavioural response to that hasn't arisen as a practical issue. And obviously, with SRIT, uh, I mean, with LBTT, it has, because there's a whole new system, and the, UK's been, uh, the rest of the UK has changed the system as well. Uh, but it's not merely a question of, of looking at the, the new areas that we may have to look at, but also you don't know to what extent any room for manoeuvre would actually be used and therefore what sort of issues are going to arise in, in forecasting that. Okay, thank you. Um, you've been asked a couple of questions about oil already, but I just I want to return to that too. Um, it's, I'm looking at page 116 of your <laughs> economic and fiscal outlook, specifically at table 4.12. And if we take, if we look at maybe 2015-16 um, in that particular table, your December forecast, it was 2.2 billion uh, for 15-16. Your March forecast is 0.7, a change of minus 1.5 billion. I'm just wondering if you can talk us through the, you, you've got pre-measures 
uh, for changes, and then you've got budget measures which change it. Obviously, the minus 1.1, that's oil prices, that's reflected in the drop in oil prices. Gas prices, I suppose, similar. Can, can you talk us through production expenditure and modelling and outturn receipts and just how those changes manifest themselves? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the assumption that the lower oil price results in lower production, I'm obviously in terms of the outlook for production, uh, we uh, use the work that uh, DEC, the Department for Energy and Climate Change, uh, has a model of how production is likely to evolve, and they in turn base that on the Oil and Gas UK's uh, survey of, uh, of what's going on in terms of activity uh, in the basin. Um, so uh, given the scale of the price change, you have to make some judgment first about what would happen to production in the absence of the government doing anything, and then what difference it would make if the government did make uh, changes. And so, as you can see, not entirely surprisingly, the production effect builds over time as you assume that the oil production, uh, oil and gas production falls further below the line that was in place in the December uh, forecast. Uh, and straightforwardly, a reduction in production generates a reduction in receipts. Expenditure moves in the opposite direction because a lot of expenditure, capital expenditure, etc., is allowable against tax. So if you have you know, a burst of, as we have seen in recent years, relatively high investment uh, in the North Sea, the hope, obviously, is that that's going to generate you more production and thus more receipts in the future. But in the near term, an increase in, a dramatic increase in investment reduces receipts because it's, uh, it's got, there's more money that the firms can set off uh, against tax. So if you have uh, you know, the assumption that the lower oil price not merely encourages lower production but also discourages investment because fewer projects are likely to get over the, the hurdle rates, then that lowers expenditure, which is actually positive for receipts rather than uh, the negative. So generally speaking, those two always move um, in the opposite directions. Modelling and outturn receipts, uh, that's partly taking on board what the latest you know, numbers through the year are showing. Uh, modelling changes here, I'm not sure whether this is specifically the case for this one, but it's often the way in which HMRC has to look at which fields are expected to produce what, and then linking that to whether the firms in question are in a position that they would be likely to be paying tax or not. So sometimes modelling changes can reflect a change in the view or, or an updating of your understanding of field ownership. Okay. And then, so there are all the pre-measures. You then got on the same table budget measures, uh, minus 0 0.2 uh, static effect, minus 0 0.2 and no behavioural effect. So what... That basically means that the, the tax changes for 15-16 will result in 200 million less. That's right. So you're, you're basically having more, more generous tax treatment, which costs money. But then over time, the assumption is that that will increase the amount of both expenditure and production uh, eventually, and that that's likely to be positive. So uh, I think roughly speaking... As a consequence of the oil price change on its own, we would have reduced expected production at the end of the forecast by about 30% by about 30 in the absence of any policy measures. Taking into account the policy measures, we assume the decline would be about 20%. So the policy measures are not assumed to be you know, sufficient to completely outweigh. They partially offset the, uh, the implications of the change in the price for production. Okay. So, you, so we're hoping for greater production, or at least not as large a decline in production as yeah. a consequence, and, and you make certain assumptions there. But in terms of the... I should just say on that, I mean, needless to say, given the size of those changes, the amount of uncertainty, both around the pre-measures forecast sure. and around, you know, exactly how much impact those... Uh, you know, those measures will have. You can make some sort of, you know, uh, you know, relatively precisely calibrated things about how many projects might this shove above the line. But there's obviously a broader, you know, psychological is not quite the word, but, you know, a, a broader confidence issue about whether this is a sector to be investing in in the long term. And, and, you know, judging that for the purposes of this forecast is not straightforward. And I wouldn't claim that we've done anything terribly scientific to try to do that. Sure. No, okay. And last question then. Just, I mean, it, so it's harder to, to predict the outcomes, I guess, is, is what you're saying, and it can move in different directions. But in terms of the, the cost of the budget measures, as it were, I mean, are they 
you, you point, minus 0 0.2 for 15, 16, minus 0 0.4 for 16, 17, 0 0.3 for 17, 18, and so on. Are they, are they slightly more predictable or are they reliant upon a range of factors as well? They are reliant on a range of factors, seeing you know, how much you know, activity is there to take advantage of those. But I think the key point to note here is that the size of you know, the specific identifiable to the cost to the exchequer of this is dwarfed by the changes in the revenues implied by the movements in production, by the movements in, in the price as well. So um, exactly how that set of incentives is going to shape up in terms of cost is, I think, much less important than the fact that, you know, it's very, very hard to predict with any confidence what a change in the oil price of this magnitude is likely to generate and how much of, the, uh, of that would be reversed by, um, by the policy measures. So there is uncertainty around those numbers, but I think that's probably the least of our problems. Sure. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mark, to be followed by Jean. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Camino. Just to, to touch a little bit more on the oil and gas, um, I note the, the adjustments that you made in terms of the budget 2015 compared against the autumn statement. Now, in the intervening period between De December and March, um, there had been uh, some upturn in, in, in the oil price, and there's expected to, you know, most forecasters are expecting there to be a reasonable upturn uh, across the rest of the year, with a, with, the, with some form of stabilisation over over the piece, um, because the the view field is that other than the Saudis, pretty much none of the other OPEC countries can sustain a a significantly lower oil price than, the, than that which we're experiencing at present. So I wonder, therefore, why there was such a dramatic adjustment for future years uh, in your forecasting, given those factors, um, which are, are, are widely being commented on. Um, perhaps you could elaborate on that? I mean, basically what we do in terms of the assumptions that we make about the oil price that are, that are factored into the forecast is that you incorporate the change in the spot price in the near term, obviously, and then we assume that the oil price moves in line with the futures curve uh, over the next couple of years. And then thereafter, and this is reflecting some research that was done uh, at the IMF, uh, you would say that the market is at that point too thin to provide you with a great deal of additional useful information and therefore that we assume the oil price is constant uh, thereafter. So if you look at the way in which things moved between December and the March forecast, the spot price was about 27% lower when we closed the March forecast, which is basically we take an average over a number of days, about a fortnight before we shut the forecast uh, to do this, was about 27% lower. But as you say, the assumption was in the market that some of that would be reversed looking forward. And so if you then look at the, uh, the oil price that we're assuming for the end of the forecast, that's only 17% only lower rather than 27% lower, which is taking into account the effect that you, you said there. Now, clearly... There are a wide variety of other forecasts uh, out there, some of which are relatively technical and data-based, some of which are drawing prognostications about the world economy, geopolitical events, etc. Uh, we've highlighted in the past using the, um, the US uh, internet, uh, energy um, uh, bodies projections, which give you an enormously wide range around the, any central forecast. Uh, but from our point of view, we don't think there's a strong case for saying that we can second guess, or that we would be in a position to second guess the futures market over that sort of time horizon. So that's what we've, that's what we've plugged in, and it's why it shows exactly what you say. You have a decline, and it's picked up a bit. I think... I haven't, um, I haven't looked at it closely recently, that, na that the decline in the oil price now, as distinct from where we were in March, is that indeed the, the spot price and the futures curve is lower still, but not by a dramatic margin. Okay. I mean, we, we've, we've touched earlier on sort of the, the ability of, of those, and I think there were a number of international analyses of oil price which, uh, you know, looking at them now do not bear bear out what, what we're seeing and and so I wonder in that respect what value you attach to five-year forecasting given that essentially between December and March you've had to radically alter your five-year forecasting I mean wh wh when when would you anticipate looking again at that five-year forecasting and making any necessary adjustments to it 
Uh, well, I mean, we, we update the forecast whenever there is a fiscal event. Under normal circumstances, that would mean that we would come back to it at the next autumn statement, which would be late November or December. Uh, of course, this may be different this year because if we have a new government that comes in and it decides it wants to have an additional budget relatively early on in the summer, uh, as the incoming coalition did in, in June 2010, we may return to it earlier than that. It's not, it depends, you know, if an incoming government wanted to announce a new uh, a package of measures and if that needed a new forecast or whether they were happy to use the basis that we've, we've had before. So we would come back to it uh, at that stage. In terms of the value of it, I think, you know, governments are trying to, they have medium term fiscal plans. I think there is a merit in producing this uh, and, you know, being able to set out a fully articulated view. But it does come back to the point, and I've, you know, done numerous talks to this effect, that you only need to look, if you look at chart 4.5 on page 114, uh, you know, this is not, if you look at the scale of the, uh, the jumps up and down in receipts, I mean, it's all, you know, we've been consistently over-optimistic about the level of oil receipts since we uh, came in, as you can see from all the blue lines lying above the black one, which has continued uh, to fall. Um, you know, but there were people around saying that we were being, you know, we were under shooting this. So, uh, as I say, the lesson I draw from this is if you look at that line, don't expect to get this right very often. Okay. Um, turning back to the um, fiscal mandate, um, I note uh, at Paras 113, 114, there's some commentary from you around that, and um, it appears that the, the fiscal mandate now applies in year three rather than in year five. And is it the effect of that that essentially the cuts in public spending? which would have taken place over a five-year period are now anticipated to take place over a three-year period. Is that essentially what, what's anticipated as a result of that? Uh, no, it isn't, because the government is not trying to, you know, to get to where it had previously wanted, to, in terms of, the, of the, uh, where the, you know, the, the, de the, the forecast of the deficit out. They haven't said, we want to get to where the OBR was forecasting we would be in year five, in year three. In which case, as you say, you would be concertinering the remaining fiscal consolidation into <coughs> three years rather than five years. So the fiscal consolidation, as set out and as implied in particular by the medium-term path of public spending, continues beyond the fiscal mandate date, and you have another year in particular of, of spending squeeze in 2018-19. So if you look at the way in which our forecast for that year has moved since December, it's not moved dramatically. So basically, you know, you, you can think of it as the government saying that at a five-year horizon, it looked as though we were going to be overshoot, you know, we were going to be overachieving this forecast by a significant margin. In the third year, we would be looking, or we would be expecting to overachieve it by a smaller margin. So now let's aim for the third year instead. So it's not trying to, as I say, do five years work in three, it's saying three is the year on which we ought to focus people's uh, attention. So you're not doing dramatically more consolidation by then. This explains at 114 the, in terms of meeting with 16.8 billion to spare compared to the previous expectation of meeting with 38.8 billion to spare. That's what that refers to then. That's, that's right, because you, know, you would expect the budget balance to be improving over time as the spending cuts go on and as the tax revenue uh, picks up. Um, obviously, the margin by which they would expect to hit it in year five, if that was still the target, would now be significantly lower than it was in December because the government has made the choice to drop this additional year of spending cuts in 2019-20 as a share of GDP. So in terms of that fiscal mandate, that's the fiscal mandate that was essentially approved as part of the autumn statement. So that's what was voted on at the autumn statement, that's that right. fiscal mandate. So the three-year three -year period. Um, and so in order to achieve that fiscal mandate, uh, if one had signed up to that fiscal mandate, um, according to what you're saying at 114, that will require there to be significant cuts in public spending either way um, in order to attain that fiscal mandate? Uh, well, I wouldn't use the word require. The, the, the government, the, the way that the policy is set out at the moment, both in terms of the tax rates, 
the benefit rates and the overall path for total spending on public services and capital investment. As a matter of fact, if you look at it over that period, uh, the current forecast implies that most of the action takes place in terms of cuts in public services uh, spending. It's also true if you look over the full five years of the forecast. If you think about getting from what is roughly a 5% of GDP budget deficit now to a small surplus in 2019-20, about 70% of that additional deficit reduction takes the form of implied cuts in public services spending uh, as a share of GDP. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't have to be the way it does it. It's what's implied by the government policy choices that we've taken on board now. And as I say, both both the coalition parties would say that if governing alone, that's not what they would want to see, and for different reasons, they would have less of a squeeze on public services. As I say, the Conservatives have talked about uh, welfare and, uh, and uh, tax avoidance measures, the Liberal Democrats about tax measures and having a different uh, degree of ambition on the overall borrowing figures. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's, it's required in the sense that that is what is implied by the, policy, the, the policies we've been given to produce the forecast, but policies can always change and people can do these things in different ways or try to achieve something different. But, the, but there, will, there, will, there would necessitate spending reductions of some form. I mean, you've mentioned welfare there, and some of us would argue that, you know, um, wel welfare spending is uh, saying you could avoid cuts in public services expenditure by cutting welfare may not be the, the appropriate measure to take, and there, there may be that argument, but that the, will necessitate there to be cuts taking place somewhere in order for the fiscal mandate to be achieved. With, with the degree of uh, uh, room for manoeuvre or margin for error that is implied in our current forecast, this is what uh, you know, arises out of current tax rates, current welfare policy, and the detailed spending plans for 15-16 and the implied spending totals for subsequent years. Any of those things could be changed by a future government if it wished to do so. It could do you know, more on tax, more on welfare. It could choose to aim for achieving a different target or the same target with a different degree of, of margin. So these are all policy choices which, but, that, but, but, but for our point of view, we have to look on the basis of current yeah, policy. But, but, but uh, you say it could choose to do, alter the target. That would presumably, therefore, be different to the fiscal mandate that was agreed to in, in, this, in, in the autumn statement, which is what I'm... Well, a, f a future government could choose to have a different target. It could also choose to try to achieve the target with a different degree of margin for error. So it wouldn't necessarily mean a different... Uh, you have to change the targets, as you say here. Uh, on the central forecast, the government is on track to meet the new mandate with £17 billion to spare. You could choose not to achieve it with £17 billion to spare, or you could choose to have a different target, or you could choose to have a different composition of measures to get you there. OK. Um, thank you. I just have a quick question. But <clears throat> the OBR forecast for household debt is that it continues to rise, and it's now, I think, according to your own papers, uh, up far above the levels of 2008. And I just wonder what your thought is about that, the sustainability of that, and if you expect that it would stabilise at any point. Um, well, I, where are we? Um, over the course of the forecast, we've got a slightly less steep increase. It's, so um, for those of you who have the book, it's on page 73, forecast of household debt uh, to income. Um, as you can see, it is, as you rightly say, uh, well, it remains broadly flat until 2016 and then picks up thereafter. Uh, primarily, the, uh, the debt-to-income ratio rises because, uh, not because this is what's, as it were, required to fuel consumer spending over this period. That's more dependent on what goes on with uh, productivity and wages. But the fact that house prices are assumed to grow more rapidly, transactions recover, and therefore quite a lot of this is secured lending on housing, uh, which has a corresponding change on the household assets side as well as on the, uh, on the debt side. In terms of why things have been revised down since last time, it's partly because in the latest data, the starting point is lower in cash terms than it was uh, in addition, uh, we have the growth in mortgage debt 
less than it was in the previous forecast, which comes back to the point that has been raised twice before about the fact that we have less housing transactions, so there's less you know, debt being, uh, being generated as a consequence of that. And we also have uh, less accumulation of unsecured debt, and that's because we have different forecasts for um, the amount that households are consuming and investing, and therefore there's less of a push up there. But you're right in terms of the overall picture. Uh, you do have the, uh, the debt-to-income ratio rising. Given what is going on with the rest of the, of the forecast, and given the stance of monetary policy, that's not necessarily a surprising or inconsistent thing, but we do highlight it as one of the potential risks to the forecast is that, you know, this, uh, um, you, know, you are seeing household um, uh, activity moving in this sort of direction, and that could be something that uh, affects the, the path of the, of the forecast. It's a broad, it's, it's a, in a sense, it's a microcosm of a broader issue with this forecast, which is that on the face of it, you know, when we were starting out talking about the growth rates of GDP, this looks a very stable picture over the next five years. You've got growth chugging along at 2.5% a year. Yes, you've got inflation falling in the near term, but basically heading back to the target. Interest rates aren't moving terribly far over the forecast implied by, um, by uh, government receipts. But within it, you've got quite a change going on in the composition because you've got a, fisc you know, a substantial fiscal consolidation continuing through this. And one quite useful way to look at this is at the, the, the various balances of net lending by each individual sector in the economy and the rest of the world, and all of those things have to add up to, to zero. And so, you know, for that to be the case, you do have, you know, this implication for household debt. We have a relatively, um, you know, robust improvement in business investment. We have some improvement on the uh, overseas balance not really the trade deficit improving very much. That remains a modest drag on GDP growth uh, throughout, uh, but um, seeing the, uh, the income balance improving. So at the moment we have a, you know, the latest figures suggest the current account balance was at its biggest deficit since the 1800s uh, in 2014. Uh, all of these things we see moving over time. So on the one hand, you have a forecast that looks very stable at a headline level, but if you're actually looking at the changes in the, in the household balances and the other balances in the economy, of which this is one manifestation, then there's, there's quite a lot going on under the surface. Okay, and just um, finally, uh, just the, the rise, I, I suppose the change in the, in the labour market generally or the rise in, in the difference that's occurring in employment, given that we have more self-employment and uh, growth in zero-hours contracts and more what feels like less stable employment practice. Do you factor all of that in? How do you forecast that kind of thing? Or? Uh, well, it's a key factor, as, as we were discussing earlier, in terms of understanding and projecting forward what uh, is going on with income tax receipts in particular. This is precisely one of the reasons why income tax receipts have been relatively uh, disappointing, as I say, partly because you've had uh, you know, headline employment uh, performing better than we've anticipated and earnings growth not picking up as we've anticipated in a series of forecasts. And then on top of that, the fact that some of the things that you highlight here have meant that you've got less receipts out of the increase in employment because you know, some of the self-employed uh, or more of the self-employed appear to be on relatively low incomes than is normally the case when you get a rise in self-employment uh, income uh, there. Um, we don't do, a, that said, an extremely detailed decomposition of the labour market forecast in exactly what sorts of employment and what sorts of contracts are going on there. We're basically taking a judgment on what the, the uh, unemployment rate consistent with stable inflation is in the medium term. And we don't have a very different view of that from the one that the Bank of England does. Uh, you assume it gets back to about 5.5%. Uh, and uh, we assume that the, that the unemployment rate will you know, not fall as fast over the remainder of the forecast than it has done in recent years, which is the flip side of saying that we think that the absent productivity growth of the recent years will hopefully come back. But that, as we've underlined here, remains one of the biggest uncertainties uh, in the forecast of if and when normal service will be resumed again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's exhausted questions to the committee. I've just got a couple really to finish on. Um, in, in, the, in the economic and fiscal outlook um, on page 178, you say, and I quote, so the UK began the period 2009 to 2014 with the second highest deficit after the US and ended with the second highest after Japan. 
And then you go on to say, the contribution of lower spending to that fall was the largest among these countries. The UK was the only country with a deficit has not been reduced by having revenue growing faster than national income. Going forward, though, I mean, is that how you, how you see it in terms of the relationship between the UK and other countries? Is there still a significant um, difference in how the UK is approaching this issue with other countries? Uh, well, we don't have equivalent forecasts. We've, we've looked back at what's happened over the last uh, few years in terms of making the international comparisons, but we don't do detailed forecasts for all the other countries looking forward. Uh, as you'll see from this comparison that we've done, you know, receipts have made less of a contribution uh, than in most other countries. There are a number of reasons for that which we've, which we've covered already. You know, the government... The coalition has announced additional tax increases, notably the increase in VAT early on. Uh, so the gross tax, inc the, uh, gross tax increase of three and a bit percent of GDP, uh, probably, uh, about half of that has been handed back in the form of other tax cuts, notably the increase in the income tax personal allowance, the reductions in the headline rate of corporation tax, and. Uh, the remainder of that gross increase uh, of gross tax increase has been swallowed up by the sort of disappointment on the effective tax rates for income tax that we've just been talking about and the cut in uh, uh, the uh, oil uh, receipts, etc. Looking forward, as I say, the deficit reduction over the next five years, you get some more in from uh, receipts, hopefully a return to earnings, to real earn wage growth and to some fiscal drag. But on the other hand, you have the effect of, of the past policy measures uh, moving in the opposite direction. Some, you know, as I say, recovery in the housing market combined with the nature of the rates on uh, the new uh, SDLT and, uh, and LBTT. But 70% of the deficit reduction over the next five years on this forecast is still reductions in implied public services spending. Where it was 80, whereas it was 82% in the current parliament. Um, that be right? Sounds plausible. I That's the that IFS figures. I just wondered if you were of the, the same view in terms of the, roughly the same kind of... It, right, yes, I mean, the 80-20 number, I mean, it depends on precisely what you know, measure you look and over what time period, whether it's that or somewhat higher. But uh, as I say, looking, for, looking backwards, you had more of a contribution from capital spending cuts in the past than we will have in the future. Uh, you know, the wel welfare changes, uh, delivering you some more of the consolidation looking forward, whereas in the past, actually, welfare spending has risen quite sharply as a share of GDP over the course of the, of the crisis and the uh, early recovery period, partly because inflation was remaining relatively high while earnings growth was relatively weak. OK, in the, the last section, the issue, what you touch on is really OBR itself. And just to give you a quote, uh, um, Edward Troop, who is the Second Permanent Secretary at HMRC, told this committee on the 21st of January that, and I quote, uh, we measure and forecast, and the published forecasts are signed off by the Office for Budget Responsibility. But we do most of the legwork on forecasting, and the analysis is done internally within HMRC. Although the OBR has been praised for its independence, from our perspective, the process feels very much the same as it was when the Treasury was doing the forecasting. We had the same conversations with colleagues in Treasury, and the Treasury would make those forecasts both then and now as HMRC it provides underlying data and the first cut of the forecasts for discussion. So just wondering what your, your comment on that is. Well, I think he's right in the sense that the first cut is correct. So for all the individual forecasts that we do, we basically provide HMRC with the economic forecast. So, you know, which, different bits of which matter for different taxes. So what's going on with labour income matters for, for labour, uh, for income tax, etc. They crank the handle on that and come back to us, uh, say, you know, in the weeks running up to a budget or an autumn statement with what they think is the, uh, uh, is a is, as it describes, as a first cut. What then happens is that we have very detailed discussions at which we tell them how we want them to change those numbers. Now, I suspect that in the old days, they did have conversations with the Treasury, who also told them to change those numbers that they came to in the first instance, uh, perhaps telling them to change them for different reasons than the reasons we tell them to change them. That's the whole point of setting up the process uh, in the first place. What I think, uh, you know, I don't think Edward meant by that is that basically HMRC comes to us with some numbers and we say, oh, yeah, that's fine, toss it to one side and go off for tea. You know, we, we, it's our forecast. 
we tell them what we want, the, what the forecast is. So if they want to have a new model to predict what a particular tax is going to generate, they have to come us, to us, tell us what they're intending, and we say whether we think it's sensible or go back and think about it again, or why don't you double run this for a while until we're happy with it. Uh, all the sort of judgments about how do you interpret what comes in terms of recent history, what the numbers are as they're coming in, during the year, which is obviously the administrative data that HMRC has, you know, is that something that's news or noise? Is it something that you're going to want to push forward into the future years of the forecast, or do you think this is a one-off, you know, distortion that'll come out? What do you want to assume about how much, you know, uh, change in avoidance is going to take place over this? So, I think it's, you know, we do we, the model for the OBR compared to, say, the larger fiscal watchdogs, is that we have a small group of people and we have a legal right to the time and effort and assistance of, in particular, HMRC and DWP on the welfare side are the ones that matter most. But the key point at the end of the day is that these are our forecasts. HMRC know that these are our forecasts and that may well condition what sort of first cut they bring to us as distinct from the sort of first cut they may have brought to the politicians when they were doing it in the old days. Uh, I think with HMRC, I mean, we do take comfort from the fact that they are, you know, we are very, uh, you know, grateful to them for the work that they do. And there is a, a meaningful degree of arm's length between them and the Treasury and Treasury Ministers. When they bring us a first cut, it doesn't have the whiff of political interference about it. It may be something that we want to change a, a lot and to come up, and as I say, at the end of the day, it's our forecast, we do it the way we want to, we make uh, the judgments. But the fact that that you know, is being brought to us in the first instance by HMRC rather than you know, by ministers, direct representatives, I think is, you know, it's a use, it's symbolically important and practically important as well, and it conditions the behaviour of everybody uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the process. So, um, uh, I think that's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a useful feature of the system. It also helps, of course, that HMRC um, have the ability to use taxpayer confidential information in a way in which, the, you know, if the, if the forecast was just being done out of the Treasury, you know, neither the Treasury nor we can see detailed taxpayer confidential information. And for things like corporation tax, that can matter quite a lot if you're getting a relatively large amount of revenue out of a relatively small number of taxpayers. But even on things like you know, I think one of the reasons at the moment why there's a different methodology for the time being, at least in terms of LBTT forecasting, is that we can use HMRC's knowledge of the detailed micro data in a way which I, th I don't, you know, I don't think that the Scottish government can see that micro data. We wouldn't see it either, but at that sort of level. And obviously there's an issue as you go forward as to you know, where the forecasting activity resides in terms of the Scottish Government, Revenue Scotland and the Commission, uh, which I know was you know, raised obviously by, by the committee and by the paper that was put out uh, last week. There's no one-size-fits-all model that works for everybody. Speaking personally for the way that we're doing the job, I take comfort from the fact that at the end of the day I'm coming up with a central forecast, not judging whether I'm willing to accept somebody else's, and the fact that we have uh, HMRC as a, as a good, robust, professional organisation providing us with material that, as I say, doesn't have the whiff of politics about it particularly. OK, well, thank you very much for that comprehensive answer, I'm just, and, and indeed for your evidence today. Is there any other points you want to make to committee before we wind up the session? No, I think we've covered everything pretty exhaustively. I think we more or less have. Well, thank you very much once again, Robert. Um, I shall, um, you know, obviously be seeing you later, but the, um, we'll, I will um, call a, a break in this session in order to allow a changeover of uh, witnesses, and we'll reconvene at 11.25.
Folks, I shall reconvene uh, the session. Uh, our next item of business today is to take evidence from members of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. I therefore would like to welcome to uh, the meeting Lady Susan Rice, Professor Andrew Hughes Hallett, and Professor Campbell Leith. Once again, welcome to the Finance Committee. And before we move to questions, I'd like to invite Lady Rice to make a brief opening statement. Yes. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I would simply state that although Scotland itself is not in Perda, uh, as we speak, that we intend to be as assiduous as ever in not being political, and you would expect nothing less than us, but I thought I should make that statement to uh, be in parallel with our colleague earlier. Um, we were last here at the end of October. We discussed the draft budget in our, our report about that. We had done a lot of work at that point. We've since done a great deal of work uh, as well. We hadn't known then how much it would have been uh, in the way that we know it now. You've received or seen three missives from us. One was a response to the minister, which you were copied in in January, uh, and then a response to yourselves in terms of relevant sections of the draft report and the 15-16 budget, and finally uh, the uh, missive that we sent in at the end of last week in preparation for this meeting. Um, rather than repeat what we have put there, we think, and given your timing as well, it would make sense simply to move directly to questions if you're content. And actually, I mean, some of the questions I'll be asking colleagues I'll ask will, be, will probably be within the document you've submitted, but I think it's important mm -hmm. that some of these things are raised for the, the public uh, record. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, in terms of the draft budget 1516, I'm just wondering, you know, how how that process will inform uh, your approach to draft budget 2016-17. We, it, in two ways, and m many of those ways reflect actually the timetable for for the development of uh, of the budget. I mean, we spent time last summer, once we actually convened in, in, in August and began functioning as a commission, uh, learning what the process was, uh, working with the Scottish Government forecasters to understand the models they have, the data they have available, uh, where the shortfalls perhaps historically might be in data, where they have a new tax uh, coming to Scotland. Uh, so we, we, we did a lot of learning. We have that now, but we've also continued over the piece to meet with them, to challenge them in various respects as they uh, develop their own approach to their work. We um, have asked for and have had uh, some sense of the likely timetable for the upcoming uh, budget, 1516 budget, um, uh, because we're told that in an election year, uh, at Westminster that the budget timetable here may be slightly altered. Uh, we intend to work um, to something like the original timetable that you would normally have to the extent that we can do because we think that that is prudent. Um, we also will simply spread out the work that was very condensed last year. Um, and so we, we have a better grasp of what needs to be done and, uh, and somewhat better grasp of when. Um, so that's a partial answer, uh, perhaps. Uh, we will continue, however. This isn't a tap that you turn on and off. Um, and we, as I say, have met with the Scottish Government forecasters on a number of times, a number of occasions, and will continue to interact with them in terms of uh, their developing um, uh, use of, of data and the way their models develop so that we stay in lockstep with them. And if my colleagues want to add to that. The point I was going to actually make just there was the fact that your colleagues can, can add to anything that I ask. So when, I, when I'm asking a question, you know, um, please any, any, any member of the panel should feel free. And I'm sorry I didn't point that out uh, earlier. Uh, to answer any question or add to any comments that my you colleagues won't hold yourself. back, so don't they're, worry. They're very shy. We know that from, having, from previous uh, committee uh, meetings. Now, in, in response to uh, the committee's own report, which you've actually uh, commented on uh, each of the relevant paragraphs, uh, the Scottish Government indicates that agreement with the development of a memorandum of understanding between it and uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission. They stated, and I quote, an interim period before the SFC is placed on statutory footing, it is proposed to prepare an MOU for agreement among the Scottish Government, Scottish Fiscal Commission and Revenue Scotland, setting out respective responsibilities and relationships. But uh, they also said that this uh, MOU would be discussed with the Finance Committee in draft, as well as members of the SFC, but as yet we haven't been consulted on a memorandum of understanding as a committee. I'm just wondering where we are with that. 
Well, I would answer initially that I think that that's a matter between the government and yourselves mm -hmm. because they are the ones who should present that to you. We have asked the government for at least a draft of sort of format and style of such a memorandum of understanding. We understand that. We need it. Um, we need it in relation to a number of bodies, not least as we look forward. Uh, we believe with the OBR, um, but certainly also Revenue Scotland and, and some others. Um, so we are ready to look at any draft we have when it's when it comes back to us. So. All right. So you're, you're so you're not any the wiser, you're not any further forward than we are in terms of this thing. Um, we don't have a draft. We've asked for one, and we will. Um, okay. Right. Okay. Maybe we've not been consulted it. on it because it's not yeah. maybe actually not getting any writing it yet. That's what it seems to be. But that's not seeming the implication at this uh, 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 point. I'm just wondering. Um, so maybe we could, we could just add. To yeah, that. sure. We, right. that we have had contact with a, a number of bodies, uh, so we, we have kind of informal working relationships with, with several relevant bodies. So it's it's really just dotting the i's and crossing the t's to get the memorandum of understanding up and running. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's an important point. This hasn't held us back um, in terms of what we felt we needed to do over this year. No, I mean I'm quite. I, I, I've, I've noticed the kind of the huge number of interactions that the. the SFC's actually had with so many organisations, and obviously you've detailed that in your report. Um, now, one of the, one of the, the, the issues, of course, is that the government is of the view that it shouldn't be the role of the SFC to produce official forecasts. What's your view on that at this point? Um, we all have views, but I'll turn to either colleague just so I don't do all the talking. Yeah, well, there's a whole range of ways of doing this. Um, we heard from Robert earlier this morning, which kind of charts a middle course of obtaining information from some bodies, but then being responsible for the overall forecast. We instead receive the forecast from the Scottish Government and then critically you know, evaluate that forecast. Uh, alternatively, you could have a body that produces everything to do with the forecast. Um, it's a question of you know, resources. You need an enormous number of resources if you want everything to be done in-house. Uh, mm -hmm. Less resources if you put some of it out of house. And it's, it's your choice. Now, obviously, I realise you don't have access to the, you know, the first-class um, um, plane travel and the chauffeur-driven limousines that Robert Choate has come to enjoy. <laughs> but, um, but the, there is an issue about the, the £20,000 budget that you actually do have as a of course, I was being facetious there in case anybody needs a record and thinks I'm not. But of course, uh, there is an issue about the, the budget that was allocated to you, which was £20,000. And I, I do actually uh, appreciate that, you know, that you, you've had to, um, you know, you, that, that Glasgow University has been very helpful in, in, in providing uh, some in-kind support. And you said in your report that our expense of 2015-16 will increase significantly. We now have the office to run. We need to develop a rather basic website. We may commission some research. We now have a part-time PA. And you're also looking to the possibility of a fourth commissioner this year. So what kind of growth and resources do you need to be able to do the job that you, that you hope to be able to do and you believe is expected of you? I cannot give you an exact number right now, and the reason for that is that the Scottish Government uh, colleagues are sort of well down the road in negotiations with Glasgow University about what expenses the university may be able to carry for us uh, in, instead of charging them back for at least part of this coming year or maybe the whole of the year. These relate uh, to some extent to uh, occupancy costs, both um, uh, cost to put some desks in an office and, and whitewash it and, and so forth, and uh, ongoing occupancy costs. We have some office operating costs. We now have a part-time PA. Um, I, through my old office, provided that kind of service gratis until the end of December. So um, we're on a new, uh, a new operating style since the beginning of the year. Um, so in, to, to give you some sort of order of magnitude, but I wouldn't, I don't think any of us would want to be held to this because we don't know the exact numbers just now. Um, we're probably talking about uh, a cost of maybe 20,000 for a PA, but the university may be helpful with that. Uh, a process has started to identify a couple of research assistants um, who, um, whose work would, uh, you know, a small piece of their time would be spent supporting our work um, and 
that cost might be in the same range. Um, having said that, again, the university may well pick up those costs. So we're just trying to get our arms uh, around this. We um, have not spent fully the 20000 this year, but that's because we, we operated hand to mouth. And, and as I say, my old office provided some gratis service uh, to, uh, to the work that we were doing. Um, we have factored in a, a bit of travel and a bit of research and a couple of conferences. Um, I would say that we're not an expensive date um, and we don't expect to be this coming year. However, uh, one of the needs that we've identified that uh, we think is really urgent, and I don't know the title, um, so it's hard to give you, it is this kind of person, but it's somebody who can um, scan the political debate, scan a lot of your debates, um, brief us, see what's happening outside and actually keep us much more closely in the loop because we're, as you know, doing this um, part-time uh, with day jobs and, uh, and we're not people who are in this circle all the time. So we need some support there. We've talked to the Scottish Government about the kind of person who would be able to be helpful. And um, it is possible if our remit grows significantly over this year because of uh, what comes out of the Smith Commission report and, and the subsequent command paper or uh, for any other reason that we might look to bring on board another economist. Um, uh, so we have a lot of questions about the cost there, but there would be an individual who would need to, and you'll have a title, I don't, um, uh, I call it the political scanner, but, um, it, it, and, and that person uh, would have to be remunerated. Indeed, I mean, but, I mean, you said you were living a hand-to-mouth existence. I mean, that can't continue, really. I mean, obviously, if you're going to be, uh, you know, a, a sustainable kind of um, organisation, you, you can't be um, relying on the kind of goodwill of your landlord, so to speak, in terms of Glasgow. I mean, right. Surely, you do need a more substantial budget in order to be effectively self-standing wherever you happen to work from, um, you know. And, and not relying on Glasgow University to pay the heating and lighting bills, so to speak. You know? uh, th that's absolutely correct. And the university, I think, doesn't uh, intend to pay them uh, forever, but they have been good hosts in the uh -huh. beginning. And um, we're working, or we are, the Scottish government uh, is working with them very closely, in fact, about uh, what costs they will carry, what they might charge back. If anything is charged back, it will go through us, you know, relating to occupancy or anything of that sort. It will go through us to approve you know that yes, we did receive this service, or we did receive the uh, the heat in the in the system, as it were. Um, but that wouldn't be forever. Uh, and uh, assuming that uh, the commission is put into statute as well over the next parliamentary session, uh, I think that also anchors us. Uh, and as we do our work over the session, we will also have a better handle on actually what those costs are. But we've put in a budget submission um, to the extent that we can do for the numbers we can predict. And you're looking for this uh, fourth commissioner to look specifically at economic matters? Or we're, we're not looking PhD today for a fourth commissioner, but we believe that um, if and as the remit expands, we might well uh, need one. Um, so that is at least a question. Certainly not for the first half of next year, I wouldn't expect, but, but we don't know. Uh, but it's, it's only proper to say that we've thought about this and discussed it. Okay, that's a couple of other questions I'm quite keen to ask, but I don't want to steal the thunder of all my colleagues, so therefore I'm going to open up the session uh, just now, and the first person to uh, ask questions from the committee will be Gavin. Good morning, thank you. Um, first question is about the subject of forestalling and the behavioural impact for LBTT. You made some, obviously, initial observations in your paper in October, um, you obviously wrote something to the Scottish Government afterwards, just in advance, I guess, of their, their Stage 3 budget. Is there any... The impression I got from the Cabinet Secretary, and I may have picked this up wrongly, the impression I got was that you were currently doing a piece of work looking at the behavioural impact and forestalling to help them in their discussions with the UK Treasury um, over, presumably, over the coming weeks or months, now that the, the financial year is closed. Is there... I mean, now, I may have picked that pick that up wrong. Are you doing any current work on forestalling or, or behavioural impact specifically for the government? Um, go ahead. <coughs> oh, that's one. Okay. Uh, I think, well, at the time of the, kind of the, the budget, we, we noted that the, the kind of modelling work of the Scottish government in this respect didn't include any behavioural responses at all. Okay. So <coughs> I think when the forestalling issue kind of 
became a bigger issue uh, in January, the Scottish Government started doing some, or Scottish Government forecasters started doing some work uh, on this, this issue. Uh, and so we've been scrutinising that work. We haven't been doing the work ourselves, okay. but uh, as fits the way we operate, uh, we've been scrutinising what, what, what they do. And I think at, at the time, we were asking for further evidence and development of this uh, estimate of the forestalling effect before we could sign off on it. Uh, and I think we were aware of kind of academic work in this area, uh, which I think feed into the, the OBR's estimates of forestalling and other behavioural effects, uh, we were encouraging the Scottish Government forecasters to, to look at this work more deeply and see if it could be replicated for, for Scotland. And so they, they've done some preliminary work looking at that but haven't gone the full distance to be able to identify effects the way it has been done uh, for the rest of the UK in that way. Okay, so you've done various bits, but so there's, there's not a live piece of work, though, as of, as of today. There's not a lot. If you're asking, are we doing an independent piece of work, or have we commissioned research or anything of the sort independently, the answer is no, that we're working, as Campbell says, consistently with our method, which is to interact with the Scottish Government um, forecasters to challenge and discuss and then meet again and take it to the next step, but not independently from those conversations. Andrew, anything? Uh, only, <clears throat> only to say, if we wanted to go any further, I think we'd need to contract out under the current regime. Okay. Which goes back to the budget question. Sure. No, no. Okay. <laughs> it all depends how much you want. I, I suppose the reason I ask is just that the, the, there will be a discussion, and I don't know whether it will be in the coming weeks or presumably coming months with, with an election going on. The Scottish Government and the UK Government will sit down to work out what was the effect of forestalling in 2014-15 the OBR have obviously given their projections on what they thought it was, and the Scottish Government will have to, to work out what they think it is and presume, and then a deal of, of some sort is done between the two governments to, to recompense the Scottish Government. So I suppose my question, are, are, you, are you involved in the, if, if the OBR are sort of uh, put what they think the case is to the UK Government, the Scottish Government haven't said specifically to you, can you tell us what you think the forestalling was for 14, 15 no, I think what, what the Scottish Government did is they gave us their initial estimates of what sure. they felt the forestalling mm -hmm. effect was, and we discussed the method they'd used to calculate that. And I think <laughs> our conclusion was that it, it may well be a reasonable estimate, it may not, uh, but we required further Very evidence important. looking at various bits of modelling work that could be done uh, kind of in, to supplement that initial work to see whether that estimate was a robust estimate or not. And we haven't I think we haven't quite received kind of updates on mm -hmm. that work that convinces of the number. Okay, thank you. The, um, the committee obviously felt in our initial report that the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission should have responsibility for producing the official macroeconomic forecasts. The government disagreed. It's probably slightly political to say to ask you, should you have responsibility for it? So I won't ask that. What I will ask, though, so is just imagine for a second the government changed its mind and said, actually, on, on reflection, we think the Scottish Fiscal Commission should be, um, in the way that the OBR does, they're res they should be responsible for the official macroeconomic forecast. They just decide that's the case. Um, could, could you do it at this stage if you were asked? Or, or if not, what sort of work would need to be done before you were ready to, to do macroeconomic forecasts? We three could not do that ourselves. Sure. Um, uh, I mean, it, absolutely not. But um, but if we if we were asked by Parliament to to do that, um, do either of you want to just say? I mean, we we yes, need resource. Uh, yeah, you, 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 the the resource implications would be yeah. would, would be quite significant. I mean, the uh, the OBR operating with, with this kind of model of doing some. Some modelling work is kind of done within HMRC, and then it has its own macro model to do its main macro forecasting. E even there, there's, I don't know quite the number of staff involved, but there's at least 30 members of staff, I think, mm -hmm. uh, are involved in producing uh, that forecast, uh, and they inherited a model from the Treasury in order to do that. Uh, as I think the Scottish Government are in the preliminary stages of developing their own macro model, uh, and we would need a team that's maintained and ran that model uh, to be able to produce a complete, coherent macroeconomic forecast. Okay. Um, all right. Next, next question is the, 
In, in your initial report, you, you commented, obviously, on the, on the Scottish Government forecasts for LBTT and for landfill tax, and then, obviously, on the underlying indicators for business rates. And I forget the exact expression, but it was, it was something like we, we could endorse these forecasts as reasonable. Um, the word endorse might be wrong, but you, something about we, we accept these as reasonable. It was something of, of that nature. What wasn't, I guess, clear for me looking at it was um, what, would, what would be unreasonable in your view and what are the kind of edges of reasonableness, if you like? I mean, there must, there must be a sort of upper, you know, there's a central projection, there's a kind of upper thing where you might be uh, being a little bit optimistic and then there's a kind of lower case scenario, presumably, where uh, you have something where things go wrong. For, for future um, uh, reports, I mean, are, are you giving consideration to sort of publishing in more detail, the sort of numbers that you would consider to be reasonable and where you think the upper or, or lower thresholds might be, or is, it, is your the intention to sort of basically, you know, say it's reasonable or it's not reasonable? Are you going to go into more detail in, in sort of future reports? Maybe I could speak in, rela in re relation to the kind of non-domestic uh, rates income. The, the initial forecasts that the Scottish Government forecasters were producing, I think we described as being on the optimistic side, so effectively it was at the upper reaches of, of reasonable. Uh, and as a result, they decided to change the forecast. So, so we were introducing language into the report uh, to indicate that it was pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable. But, but the judgment of reasonableness is based on what the forecasters themselves uh, have chosen to work with what the work that they've done. Um, and, you know, we, we're not saying they should have used these data or something else. We've taken what they've presented and we've then gone back, challenged, and made that judgment. Um, yeah. Um, uh, very difficult to publish numbers that you think are reasonable in contrast to what the uh, government is doing um, because we don't endorse specific numbers. We endorse, if we do, uh, the way of doing it and that the outcome is as reasonable as you can expect in the circumstances. There's obviously an enormous judgment going in there because you might, uh, you might academically want a much more tight model mm -hmm. or, or, or some other data or something which doesn't exist. So you have to, reasonable is within the context of what, what you can do. So there's a compromise in there. Um, and uh, so that, that's, I think, an explanation a bit of, of, of what we think was reasonable. Um, and what we thought was not reasonable wasn't is so much in numbers where places, the places where things could be better uh, were is in the other form of uh, behaviour. When, when you've been talking about the behavioural responses, you've been largely talking about when the taxes change, how do people uh, alter their behaviour in consequence, which is the forestalling part. Um, but there's also the behaviour of what goes into, uh, in, into an in LBBTT, into the housing market, from the uh, economic circumstances surrounding that and the financial circumstances. So how national income has grown, how, what's happened to interest rates, the mortgage rates, uh, the lending ability and all those sorts of things. Uh, and the, the, my take on this is that's the biggest part of what's missing, in the, at least in the residential part. Um, we were also concerned that the non-residential part was probably the weakest part of the forecasts. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very difficult to, to go any further with that because it's very difficult to model. I think that's fair to say. So it, it wasn't so surprising, but if we could make any progress in that, that's where I would put a priority on it. And having been through the forestalling uh, exercise, um, I would say um, you can pick holes in the way it was done, but at the end of the day we came down to £20 million, which would be wonderful on my bank account, but is relatively small in the context. <laughs> Um, and maybe that's not the highest priority from now on in, uh, try and get some of the bigger numbers dealt with better. So that's you know, where uh, I would approach the problem from being the, the less reasonable parts, if that's an answer to your question. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of bigger numbers, I mean, have, have, has the Scottish Fiscal Commission been formally asked to do anything in relation to the Scottish rate of income tax at this stage? Um, we have understood it to be part of our remit to become involved with that, um, presumably starting in the next legislative year. Um, as a result, the Scottish Government uh, officials have 
um, sat down with us and um, just given us a bit of history, a teaching, if you will, to, uh, to get us started in terms of our thinking. Yeah, uh, add to that, we also had a, a, a teleconference, um, one of the ones which worked. Um, yes, that's true. <laughs> we have problems with BT. Um, <laughs> I had to get that in. Um, with, uh, with the OBR people doing the same thing, uh, viewed from London. Um, so the extent to which we've engaged is trying to understand how they do it and to understand how the process is supposed to work over the next few years rather than do something on it and say, we expect this kind of number to come out. And, and we're conscious of the fact that this is a shared tax. It's sure. different from the ones we've been dealing with. Great. Thank you. Convener, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, I have to say, when the Convener was asking you about you know, your budget of 20,000 and um, you know, the kind of settling in arrangements, I, I have to say I felt personally a little bit uneasy that we're expecting you to do quite a lot of work on really very little resources. I mean, maybe I should just relax and say, well, we're settling in. I mean, I mean, I mean is that how you folk feel about it, that we're in a kind of settling in period, so we just accept, uh, and then things will settle down in due course? Um, I think we're past a settling in period. I think that um, what we've learned over the piece is that there's a whole lot more to um, the development of a budget than the draft budget in October. Uh, and um, we've learned what the work is. I mean, if, if you were to ask us, and we, we're not scientific about this, but I think my two colleagues would say they're putting in, in terms of time, at minimum a day a week and, and sometimes more. I'm doing probably double that. Um, for people who are, excuse me for saying this, unremunerated and doing this uh, against a backdrop of day jobs, um, that's a, you know that's more than just over settling in. Um, yes. So so you know it, this is becoming serious business. Let me put it that way. Yes. Well, that, that, that's exactly my feeling. I mean, I personally yeah. think very highly of the three of you, and uh, you know I think you should be properly resourced. And we've talked previously about the independence yes. of yourselves as a commission, and part of that surely has to be that we get a fixed budget at some stage and fixed arrangements, and then you are much more distinct because, I mean, the, the number of times you mentioned the government's involved in speaking to the university, I mean, all of that gives the impression of you not being independent. Now, that's not to say you aren't independent in your forecasting, but there's a kind of ongoing close relationship there which I'm not altogether happy about. Um, let me say that I think if you, we were um, given a so-called framework document um, by the government, um, which I, I assume you will have seen at some point. This is the end of last summer. But in there, it talks about um, how some of the budgetary matters specifically will, will operate. Um, so the government, at the end of the day, foots the bill. Um, so if we, um, you know, travel, uh, or, you know, take a train to Glasgow or something, and there's a travel expense there, uh, we put the expense request in onto the public sector system, and it goes through the hopper that way. So I think that there is a, a role stated for the government in relation to the monies. Um, but we are the ones trying to build, and we have already submitted some numbers, what we think it will cost us. We are in really um, a real estimate how, what it will cost to run the office. This is office supplies and phone calls and photocopy, you know, those kinds of things. Based on some guidance we got from Glasgow University colleagues, and it had nothing to do with the government, came up with a figure of, and this includes some travel as well, obviously, around £18,000 for the year. So um, we're building that budget from our own base, but they have been involved in ascertaining the transitional piece from Glasgow paying to us paying. Okay, well, um, I mean, but we don't disagree, sorry to interrupt. Yes, no. we, I don't debate the point at all. We do need to be on a proper uh, proper footing in terms of budget. No, yeah, okay. intervene, on that, uh, intervene on that a wee bit. Um, I think ultimately it's very important that we become a budget line. Yes. A yes. separate yes. Budget, yes. budget line. Uh, when, uh, when you say settling in, I think it's not so much settling in, we're um, in limbo <laughs> somewhat because we don't know what uh, is going to come further down the track, both with regards to uh, further devolution and uh, any other, which seem to pop up every now and again, any other obligations undergoing statutory. Um, and we may have views as to whether that's a good idea or not. We're not quite sure what, how we're going to get loaded up with. So um, starting off <clears throat> with a ridiculously small budget is, is fine. We, we discussed that certainly when I was being 
grilled on whether I should be honest or not, uh, to, to expand as things expanded. Yes. That's to be expected. And uh, I guess we can take a shot at what numbers those might be. But it's a little premature at the moment, so we don't actually know how much it's going to expand. I, I imagine it will become setwise, in fact, finally, because things will get added further yes. down the track. Yes, in one sense, that's when I was saying, using a word like settling in. I mean, the, the problem yeah. is that the, probably over the next few years, there are going to be quite a lot of changes in your yeah. remit. Uh, that's uh, right. It's not, it's not going to come in one... Every year. One, because, I mean, one, one area, for example, in our previous report, we'd looked, uh, talked about did you have a remit uh, for long-term investment commitments and the whole area of, um, like, prudential borrowing and so on. And, I mean, at the moment, the government says that I think you don't have a remit... Uh, within that, and in your response, um, that I think you say this is a point for future consideration, as it's well beyond the expectations of the SFC for today, uh, which is fair enough, I guess that's still the position, um, but potentially that's something that if it did come on board, that would yeah. require f other yeah. resources. I, I think we have plenty of views on that, but it, it may not be the, quite the point at which we discuss them, but uh, I think you're probably right to say that they're going to have to be discussed. And, and, and either taken on board or not. And but, there has resource implications, of course. But also, just to be fair, we were told from the beginning we had a budget of 20,000, and if we needed more during this year, um, perhaps for research or for projects or for anything, that we could ask for that. So, so it's not as if the purse was closed had we needed it, but for what we've done so far, we haven't needed to ask for more. But that isn't an ideal situation to be in. You're absolutely right. We should have our own budget. OK, I appreciate your frankness on that. I mean, the other main point I wanted to just touch on was, it, I mean, as I understand it, your remit is to comment on the reasonableness of the forecasts. Yes. And we've already talked about uh, a little bit about is it the higher end of reasonableness or the lower end of reasonableness. I mean, as an accountant, I like numbers. I mean, would it be fair to say that, uh, you know, would it be possible to mark reasonableness out of 10? And something is 9 out of 10 or 2 out of 10? Or is, is that being far too... A mathematical. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's huge range of errors associated with these forecasts. So there's there's a kind of you know if you, if you look at the fan charts of the Bank of England or the robustness that the OBR do, you change an assumption, the forecast will go in a different direction. So there's there's quite a range of um, of single point estimates that would be reasonable. I think what, we're, what we tend to assess as much as that point estimate is the methods that have been used to produce it. So we're, we're very concerned about so what assumptions have been made in this modelling work, how detailed it is, what effects are they accounting for, what are they failing to account for. Uh, and, and so it's the kind of the robustness of the approach that's been followed is essentially what gives it the score of reasonable. Yes, I, I suppose that just you know, raises a few questions in my mind. Like, like you, your process could be quite reasonable, apparently, all along the way, but then the result, you know, is the actual result reasonable or not? Or are you saying, basically, you're not commenting on that? Well, no, it was, no it's an iterative approach. If you see that the, the approach that's being followed is going to lead to a kind of wild forecast that has no credibility at all, then there's something wrong with that. Right. that approach fundamentally. So. And do you feel then that the comment you give, it, it, you've got the scope to be kind of nuanced or, or whatever the word is as to this is very reasonable, this is quite reasonable, this is a little bit reasonable? I mean, yeah. I mean how, do you, how do you see that happening or is that just something that's evolving? Well, I think that's, uh, that's something that kind of evolves and, and it, comes, it comes into our report. I mean, is, we've already kind of used language to yes. indicate where in the range of reasonableness uh, that particular forecast happened to be. And you're happy with that? basically? Uh, yeah, g given, that given, g given that we're not responsible for the forecast, uh, yes. this, this, yes. this is the way to do it, I think. But, but I think the, the language, I mean, as Campbell has already said, had an impact where we said we thought the, the, the actual number, the end, the end number, was optimistic. Um, there was a change in what was put into the draft budget as a result mm -hmm. of that comment. So we think that has been effective. Right. So that's probably something, again, we need to keep watching over yeah. time as to how the language you use feeds into what actually happened. Yeah. Uh, Fair yes. enough. Yeah. I would also add, we had a quote earlier from Alan Greenspan, who is well known for being opaque. And uh, the problem with this is if you uh, use language, you have to establish what the words actually mean. Absolutely, yes. Um, scoring one out of ten is, is um, inviting disagreement, but... Uh, 
It's easier if you, it's the same as Campbell said with the fan charts. It's basically what you're saying is it's reasonable to this degree of probability or something. Um, but that's hard to write in a report for, for everybody. I mean, I know what I mean when I'm saying that, and you might as well, but not everybody else does. Yes. So it's, it's a bit awkward. Um, what I think uh, we do do is, having said something is reasonable, then there's some qualifications further in the language, which is not in, you know, it's reasonable, but not very reasonable. It's reasonable, but here's some things which need to be improved or something. This is giving a, a, a qualification to it, and sometimes we say it's reasonable without any further comment, which means this is probably as good as you're going to get. We may find that we, I'm not sure all of us will be here, but um, we may find later on uh, that when we've got a bit of a track record of the forecasts and the actual outturns, we've got a better handle on um, how reasonable is reasonable. Mm -hmm. you know, we've discovered that these ones are not terribly sensitive, so they tend to stay within a certain okay. reasonable <laughs> excuse me, band around the, the central forecast. The other ones are much more volatile. Yes. So, I mean, in the OBR papers, we saw things, statements like, you know, there's a 65% probability of such and such, or this is a probability of over 50%. Well, a probability of over 50% doesn't reassure me very much. I mean, do you think you would go down that way as, as language, or would you prefer just to stay to the words? I would prefer to stick to the words. I, I don't find 50% probability that all that bad compared to it might be 30%. <laughs> so it's all relative. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it, it, it's, it's a judgmental factor, of, ultimately, even how you interpret it and so on. So I'd rather uh, not get too fancy, um, but try and establish... Um, a way in which you and everybody else understands what we mean when we use certain language. Okay, thanks so much. So just to move up, before I, I, I let uh, Mark in, just on the issue of reasonable, surely it's not so much about whether it's reasonable, it's whether there's a, a, an issue of political influence. Is that not one of the, the concerns that there may be? Yeah, maybe I can. Uh, I was listening to this kind of little discussion here. I was thinking... Maybe rather than think about in terms of reasonableness, it's whether or not we've been convinced that the way this forecast has been produced and the number that's been produced as a result of it uh, is convincing. Uh, and obviously, if it was subject to political interference, it, it wouldn't be convincing. Okay. So it's, it, it, it's as much of that of the Scottish government forecasters saying, look, here's our methods, here's our models, th these are good, solid ways of doing it, or and we critically evaluate those and say, well, no, I'm not convinced by that. Let's do that a different way. Maybe do that a different way uh, until they've produced enough kind of supporting evidence for their forecast to be able to convince us. OK, thank you. Mark? Thank, thank you, Convener. I have to say the Deputy Convener has given the, the, the image of the forecasting being scored by the Fiscal Commission as if it were an episode of Strictly Come Dancing, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll just leave that one out there. Um, I, 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 I would not dream of doing so. Um, in terms of the uh, looking ahead to the workload that you anticipate or, or potential workload that you anticipate, obviously um, the, there will be legislation being brought forward in relation to the Fiscal Commission. Um, I, I would anticipate it will probably be this committee that will, look at, will certainly look at the financial memorandum. I would anticipate we will probably be the ones who will be allocated the legislation. But um, looking at the costs that will be associated with that, um, you, you've mentioned today, for example, the, 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 the requirement for somebody to be essentially your eyes and ears um, uh, out there. Um, there are probably also going to be administrative <laughs> requirements that sit behind that. Uh, and then you've spoken about potential further requirements depending upon the outcome of the, um, the process of further devolution and where that leads. So I'm just wondering, in terms of the discussions you'll be having with Scottish Government, as that legislation is developed and in terms of the costings are developed, are, are you going to be feeding that information in, in terms of what you anticipate your requirements to be so that they can build a, a sort of accurate picture of the likely budget that, that, will, that will need to be attached to the Fiscal Commission? The short answer is yes, and we have been doing that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's building in a number of scenarios as well, um, because obviously um, the, we don't yet know what the final outcome of the of the devolution process is going to be. We've got a we've got a rough idea based on the command paper, but obviously, what happens in in uh, in, in just uh, just over a month's time may uh, alter that significantly. It may alter it slightly. It may not alter it at all. So, 
there needs to be some cognizance, I guess, of, of where that, that process is going, and that might lead in a number of different directions in terms of, for example, you were speaking about the possibility of requiring another economist. Mm -hmm. It may require you to have uh, additional staffing uh, beyond the one individual that you've, you've spoken about or potentially admin support that may be attached to that. So um, are, are, are you... That, building in a number of different scenarios. That, that's all, that's all correct in that we've identified some of those same potential needs, um, but we have not um, built scenarios in the, in the formal sense saying if this happens, then, then we need exactly that. But um, what I've already mentioned is our eyes and ears. We think we need that now. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced we need that now. Um, that there are s some more powers coming, almost no matter what, but we don't know t what, when, and to what extent. Um, hence, we have already put a line in the sand about the real possibility of another economist, but probably sometime during the year. Um, I, I personally don't believe that you, you build up staff, you don't build an empire uh, until you, you know, or an army of soldiers until you need to, to deploy them in a sense. Um, but that's, that's, you know, that's on the ground. And also the fact that we would need more, uh, just more support in general, as you say, more admin support of one sort or another, research support. Um, but we haven't done it in the sense of a formal scenario, you know, with a capital S. Mm -hmm. But we've put all of those on the table as potentials. Um, okay. If it's helpful at all, uh, in, in comparing to other fiscal councils elsewhere, uh, for example, the Irish one has five commissioners like us, um, and they don't do any forecasting. They do, of course, have more things to consider because <laughs> it's not a question of dev devolution. That happened 100 years ago. Um, but uh, you know, these are markers of, of, of the kind of uh, resources you need, manpower you need uh, to deal with these things. They have a number of other people, and I can't remember without my notes, which are all here, but forgotten at the moment, how many other uh, people they have um, going through the numbers and checking, as it were, um, what, their, what their view is. So that's just a bit of a marker as to what might be coming down the, the road. Okay. I think in this respect, one, one of the crucial things is as you give us more tasks, it's, it's the nature of those tasks. Do they require us to scrutinise work that's done by the Scottish Government forecasters or do they require us to do our own analysis on top of that? And as soon as we're asked to do additional analysis, produce our own forecasts, then there's an exponential rise in, in the resources that we need. I think the, 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 the position that the Scottish Government has taken, certainly at the moment, is that it doesn't... In it uh, doesn't uh, expect the Fiscal Commission to be producing its own forecasts at present. So uh, we'll be operating, I imagine, within that envelope at present. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, there was this question which came up, and I'm not sure if it's still live or not, as to whether we should uh, look at, I avoid the word reasonableness, the affordability of the investment projects. If we were required to do that, and I don't think we were in a position to do that, but if we were, that would be a, a huge increase in the workload and hence the resources needed, because you get ready into some details there. Andrew's referring to these long-term uh, commitments, the long-term investments. At the, at the moment, I think it's probably yeah. off the agenda, but, but I'm not entirely sure about that. But if it were to come on the agenda, uh, so it depends what we're asked to analyse. Sure, I appreciate that. And obviously there have been, you know, uh, others out there have made their own calls around what they believe yes. needs Indeed. to happen. And um, there, there perhaps, would you suggest, hasn't been a cognizance within some of those calls of the the level of budget that would be required in order to deliver what is being requested by some. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, this is a process. I mean, and, and there will, I assume, be discussion about what we become over time, and that has to be costed, and someone has to make a decision in the Parliament about where the value for money sits. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, there appear to be no further questions from committee. Oh, Jean, sorry. You sorry, could, you could have... Yeah, well, Let me know I'm in earlier. But yes, I know. I should have done. Um, I suppose it's just just the point, uh, Lady Rice, that you, you've said that you're working two days a week and <clears throat> Professor Hughes had it and, and Campbell Leith are working approximately one day a week. Is that a workload that you expected? Um, <laughs> I'll turn to my colleagues. To be, to be very honest... We expected a fairly intense period in the late summer in the build-up to the 
draft budget in our report then. I'm not sure any of us, but my colleagues may disagree, expected it to continue with the pace it has. This isn't every single week, but some weeks are much more. Um, so we're a little quieter in November, but otherwise it's been all go. Absolutely, and it's lumpy. Yes, well, thank you, obviously. <laughs> Um, and as, as Susan says, uh, the lumpiness is smoothing out in the, <laughs> in the wrong direction as far as workload is concerned. Um, I, I, would reckon, I would have reckoned on, on a day a week on average across the year. I reckon with, I don't know about Campbell, but I'm getting t towards two. You know, because other things happen. Sometimes they happen with very short notice, which is also difficult because if we've got other lives and we have to have other lives in order to have food on the table, um, you, you plan, I'm planning uh, out a year ahead. And to be told on Friday that by Tuesday, would you comment on this, please, uh, sometimes doesn't fit. Mm. So, you know, I've been known to do it in an airport or something. It, it's, it's, it's difficult to regulate in that sense. But this is all part of the settling in, I guess. Mm. And then, in, 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 in the second year, we'll be much better at forecasting our own, not, our own <laughs> yes. rather than the economy. <laughs> With more success. <laughs> yes, it was. Like the other commissioners, it has proved to be quite uh, demanding in terms of time, given I have a, a full-time job to do uh, outside of the Fiscal Commission work. Uh, in fact, in relation to the budget, one of the things that might help going forward is, is if the, the budget put provision to buy out time for commissioners from their employers, so that, that that would free up time to devote to Fiscal Commission work. Is I think you should get paid, you know? and I mean the, your workload's only going to increase surely. So I mean, it would, one would have thought it was reasonable to be paid for this. I mean, I know it's a kind of prestigious position, but even so, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, okay, Robert does it for free, but it doesn't mean everyone else. <laughs> 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 well, well, I'll take this time for free. <laughs> okay, Jean, that was a good question. Actually, it was a good question. Um, just a, a couple of questions to, 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 to kind of um, finish off, really, you know, and one of it, one is really, um, in, in terms of uh, your role in evaluating Scottish Government figures in relation to outturn figures, you've said um, in your response to Finance Committee report on the draft budget, you've said, um, and I quote, it is indeed our intention to compare forecasts to actual outturn figures. Once you have figures for the outcomes that match the forecast made on the current techniques, at the moment we haven't been given sufficient data on matching pairs. I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Um, what are these matching pairs? The, the forecast on the actual outturn. All oh, right, okay. In a specific... Okay. Uh, a okay, I wasn't case, familiar with the date. lingo, so that's fair enough. That's yeah. okay. I just wondered if there was something exotic in there I should maybe know about. But that, the, the having that having, that having said that, I think uh, my, my view is that's the next thing, uh, the next most important thing for us to do. The problem is we need to actually have the data on the out that was clear from the quote uh, on the outturns and not a sample of one. So otherwise, it's going to be a, a period of time before we can do that properly. And do you have access to HMRC data at all? No. 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 And won't get it. I don't think. Right, okay, that's interesting. Right. Well, I, I, didn't, I thought that was the, the, the case. And just uh, one other uh, question. Are you, uh, I've, uh, um, I understand you've had um, discussions with Sweden and the Republic of Ireland in terms of the official fiscal commissions, but have you, are you aware of any other subnational um, fiscal commissions? And if so, have you had any discussions with any of them? That's a very good question. Very, very interesting. Scotland is one of the very tiny number. Ontario, I believe, has a new one. It's at Ontario. Mm. Canada was Australia, I thought, maybe. Possibly. Yeah. Um, Campbell and I are going to a meeting of fiscal and budget officers um, that the OECD is, is hosting. And, um, and I actually asked uh, the Lisa Van Trapp, who, who runs that piece of, of the OECD, about other subnational bodies, and uh, the answer was very few. The hope there is that we actually meet whoever is there and can have some conversations, understand some of, you know, how they've developed, if they've preceded us at all. But to some extent, this is breaking new ground. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, as far as I know, uh, the subnational ones are Ontario, California. I asked last time I was in Virginia, because I was told there was one there, but there's something else, but there isn't, uh, there isn't something there. And there may be others, um, but the other places to look, actually, one place to look would be in Belgium, uh, for very obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit of this, and it's particularly important for us because uh, the difficulty, we have difficulties uh, due to the fact we're subnational rather than national, um, which other councils don't have. So other people's experience, 
will be interesting. The, the only question is whether they've got more experience than we have, and they may, they may not. I can, I, can, I can follow up on some of, on some of that, but they yeah, may but well be there in Vienna. Yeah, we're hoping to meet some of them if they exist. Okay, well, thank you very much. Are there any other points you wish to make to committee before we wind up the session? I don't have any other except to, others except to thank you for you know, inviting us in. I don't know about my colleagues. No, no thank, thank you, you. Uh, very much. Um, your responses to our questions are much appreciated. Um, that being the end of the public session of the committee, I'd now like to just have a one-minute break where I'll allow our witnesses and um, public and official report to leave.